potentials. And uh, we are going to be zooming in on a, a fascinating auditory evoked potential called the frequency following response or the envelope following response. And uh, we've got two really um, amazing speakers today. Uh, we've got um, Dr. Anant Narayan Krishnan from um, you know, the US. Um, and we've got Dr. Sandeep um, from, from uh, India. And uh, as, as you guys might be knowing, some of you, they are amazing uh, at what they do. And uh, you know, they, they, they are really good at, at, at this um, topic. So we've specially invited them and I'm really grateful to both of them um, to agree to, to, to speak on this topic today. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. If everyone could just keep their mics and cameras off during the uh, webinar uh, so that uh, you know we don't have any interruptions in between. Also, if I may request that um, you put your questions in the chat box uh, that you may find um, in the applet um, and we will deal with the questions uh, at the end um, after the webinar. Uh, you know, completes. I will address the questions to each of those speakers, depending on who that question is addressed to, and then we can cover those questions then. So uh, without further ado, um, I welcome the first speaker for today's webinar, uh, Dr. Sandeep. He is uh, the professor of audiology at All India Institute of Speech and Hearing. Um, for some of you, um, he, he may not need any introduction. Uh, according to me, he is one of the top academics um, that we have uh, in audiology in India. Uh, he's a brilliant um, mind. And uh, I think uh, over the last few years, I've known him. Um, he's very, very humble um, and, and very knowledgeable, um, regardless of what topic in audiology we ask him to speak on. Uh, I've, I've always been amazed by his knowledge and uh, actually his teaching skills as well. He's, he's an amazing teacher. Uh, he's he's uh, a very humble person and a uh, very knowledgeable person. I'm really grateful that he's agreed uh, to talk uh, in this webinar today. Um, I welcome you, Dr. Sandeep. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to help us with this webinar. Over to you, sir. Mm. Imran, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. So, good afternoon, uh, all. Uh, first of all, I would like to request everybody not to take uh, all those uh, nice things that uh, Imran uh, told about me very seriously. Uh, it's like the way they say, you know, to, to be seen by the world, you should stand on the shoulders of the giant. And today I'm uh, standing. Uh, in the same platform uh, as that of Dr. Anant Narayan Ravi Krishnan. He's truly a giant in the field of uh, you know, EFRs and FFRs. And that's how so many lights on me. That's all. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of uh, Special Interest Group of Clinical Audiology for considering me uh, to deliver this particular talk. Uh, I was very happy when they uh, approached me for this talk. However, I agreed to it very quickly. However, uh, when I got to know that, you know, Dr. Ravi Krishnan is also uh, there in the same platform, I was a little worried. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, sir has been uh, my examiners for my thesis and uh, I've seen uh, all his work and the standard of work, uh, the kind of uh, outcomes that have come uh, uh, from his research is just uh, too, too fantastic. And uh, it's an honor that, you know, I'm, I'm sharing the platform with him uh, today. So to begin with, uh, my topic is clinical and research utility of AEPs. As uh, Imran told, the focus is on the EFRs and FFRs. However, I'm going to give a general uh, overview of clinical and research utility of uh, AEPs. See, the moment uh, uh, I started uh, sitting for, to prepare for this talk, uh, I was kind of lost because, you know, it's too broad a topic. Clinical and research utility of AEPs is too broad a topic. How do I uh, do justice to that in 45 minutes? That was my big question. So I had to draw boundaries 
for uh, this because you know I have I have to complete in forty five minutes. So I started drawing boundaries. So first I thought you know I will give Sandeep's perspective of clinical and research utility of AEPs. Uh, in the sense, you know, what is my experience of clinical and research utility of AEPs, whatever little experience that I have, I thought, you know, I'll share that. So you will find that, you know, when I include studies, when I'm presenting studies, I will be including uh, uh, most of the studies that we have done at AISH. And I also include, it doesn't mean that, you know, I don't respect the studies done outside, just that, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity for me to showcase the work done at AISH in terms of clinical and research uh, utility of AEPs. So I had to complete it in 45 minutes. That's, that was another boundary for, uh, for me. And another boundary for me was I have to present the information to clinical audiologists. So if I go too much research, research, you know, they may not really appreciate it. So I have to keep it uh, aligned to the interests of clinical audiologists. And uh, lastly, because the stalwart Dr. Ravi Krishnan was uh, going to talk about EFRs and FFRs, I very conveniently uh, moved EFRs and FFRs from my, from my presentation. So with that, let me start my talk by giving you an overview of what happens in recording of EEGs. As you all know, there are two types of uh, two ways in which you can record the EEG. One is near field recording, other one is far field recording. Near field recording is when uh, is we place the electrode at the generator site. So we use needle electrodes and we go close to the generator site and we do the recording. Far field recording is what we have been practicing for all the clinical and research, research purposes in the, in the country as of now. That is, we place the electrodes on the scalp and we rec record the potentials, analyze them, and interpret whatever we get out of it. Now, when we are doing far field recordings, or in general, when it comes to the electrical activity that are associated with neurons, there are two types of potentials. One is action potential, other one is post-synaptic potentials. Action potential is from the cell body till the axon, you know, what runs the electrical activity that runs is the action potential. Postsynaptic potential is the activity that happens at the postsynapse here, where the, the axonal terminals are getting connected to the postsynaptic cells. You know, these points, whatever activity happens, that is called as postsynaptic uh, potential. There's a common conception that we are recording action potential. That is not true. Maybe it is true when it comes to the first peak and second peak of auditory brainstem responses. But by and large, when we are talking about the other auditory evoked potentials, we are primarily recording postsynaptic potentials. That's because in far field recording, it is difficult to record the action potentials because action potentials get canceled by the time they reach from generator side to the electrode. Whereas post-synaptic potentials get summated and they can be easily recorded in the far field uh, approach. We can do two types of recording that is continuous recording or online averaging. What we do in our clinical work is primarily the online averaging. That is, you know, we present multiple stimuli and the time logged activity that is coming for each stimulus is going to be averaged then and there itself. That's how the default setting is made. The other approach is, which is more commonly used in the research purpose is to have the raw material, the raw EEG. So without doing any filtering, without artifact rejection, without setting any analysis window, we just record all the electric, electrical activity that comes continuously, maybe for few seconds or few minutes. And then using that raw EG, I do a post hoc analysis. I do filtering later, I do artifact rejection later, I do all kind of uh, you know, uh, signal treatment later and I derive the waveforms. I'll show you an example of continuous EG recording. The other approach is we can record AEPs either using few channels or we can record using multiple electrodes as in this case. 
So you can see here, generally when we are doing clinical recordings, we are doing either a single channel recording or a double channel recording. Typically when we are doing threshold estimation, we go for single channel recording. Whereas when we are going for site of lesion testing in ABR, we go for double channel recording. Particle responses when we are recording, normally we go for multi-channel recording, but we never go more than four channels uh, in for the clinical purposes. So when we are recording for research purposes, we prefer to have enormous information and so that you know we can actually derive what we want to derive on a later time. So here you can see that there are multiple electrodes. So you can have a 64 electrode array, you can have a 128 electrode array, or you, you can have a 256 electrode array. So accordingly, the caps will be designed and the information will be recorded from all these electrodes simultaneously. And later we do a postdoc analysis of that data. Okay, so this is a video once. Yeah, you can see this is a continuous EEG recording. You can see that it is being recorded in multiple channels. There are two independent concept, concepts. You can have a single channel recording, but a continuous recording. You can have a multi uh, channel recording and an online averaging. Both are possible. Okay, so this shows the continuous EEG recording as well as it shows that the rec uh, recording is being uh, is happening at multiple electrodes simultaneously. Okay, I have recorded EEG, but what is the information that is available for me in the EEG signal? So as you can see, this shows that now when I'm recording EEG by placing electrode on the scalp, I'm not just recording AEPs, I'm also recording the multiple neural activity that is happening in the head. It could be related to cognition, it could be related to audition, it could be related to motor activities, it could be <clears throat> other sensory activities. Now, electrode <clears throat> not differentiate among these. So electrode will pick up all this neural activity if it comes within the frequency filter that you have set, if, you have, if it comes within the artifact ejection that you have set, if it comes within the analysis window that you have set. So here you can see that, you know, this is one activity, this is another activity, this is a third activity. And ultimately when I'm recording at the electrode, I will be recording it like this, a combination of all three activities. This is just a representation. So in this EEG signal, what do I have? I have frequency information, I have time information, I have phase information, I have amplitude information, and I have information about the synchrony if I'm presenting multiple stimulus and recording the EEG. The biggest advantage of the artery work potentials compared to even a technique like MRI is the temporal precision. I think when Sir talks about EFRs and FFRs, uh, he'll, he'll stress more on the temporal precision of the artery work potentials. So in general, you should know that when it comes to techniques like MRI, they have wonderful spatial precision. Whereas when it comes to artery work potentials, we have wonderful temporal precision. Now, how do I explain this? If you take auditory brainstem responses, the fifth peak is supposed to occur at 5.6 milliseconds. Suppose if there is any abnormality or maybe a, an acoustic neuroma, it might delay the fifth peak by 0.4 milliseconds. 0.4 milliseconds is hardly any difference, but even that 0.4 milliseconds delay is accurately reflected in your auditory brainstem responses. That is what I mean by temporal precision. The fine changes in the timing aspects of the neural activity is being represented in the artery work potentials, which is which cannot happen even in techniques like uh, MRI. What am I deriving out of this frequency, time, phase, amplitude, and the synchrony information? I can derive a lot of things. I can derive the pitch coding in the brainstem or the cortical neurons. I can derive central auditory processes. I can derive where the what is the origin of the neural activity? For example, you know, I, I have used a unique stimulus paradigm and that is, uh, uh, you know, that is reflected in the waveform, then I can actually do, if I, have, if I have the high density EEG recording, 
it is possible for me to go and localize the source of the activity. For example, I use an auditory mode and an auditory visual mode. What are the differences that happen in the brain for an auditory mode and auditory visual mode? There would be definitely differences in the neurons that are activated. That can be actually traced using these basic informations on frequency, time, phase, amplitude, and synchrony. This is an example by, uh, you know, it's a study by Sco et al. in 2011, where he actually looked at the phase uh, across time in musicians and non-musicians. And he found that, you know, there is a, uh, a lot of difference in the way the phase of the stimulus is being coded in musicians and non-musicians. The uh, phase is coded a lot accurately in musicians compared to non-musicians. We all know that there are various auditory evoked potentials. We know that there is ABR, AMLR, LLR, frequency following responses, envelope following responses, ASSRs, P300, mismatch negativity, P600, N400. There are multiple potentials. And what should we know? We should know that different AEPs reflect different processes. Don't expect every AEP to do the same job. Each AEP involves a different underlying neural mechanism. Each AEP involves a different neural generator. Therefore, the information that I'm getting from these AEPs is going to be different. Now, if I expect P300 to uh, do the same job as that of the auditory brainstem response, that's not a right expectation, okay? P300 is meant to tell us a completely different neural mechanism, whereas auditory brainstem response involves a completely different neural mechanism. So each AEP is different in terms of the information that it is conveying to us. It being whatever topic, clinical and research utility of AEPs being a very broad topic, I've tried to concise under these four headings. One, APs for threshold estimation, never ending innovations. APs as a site of lesion, uh, as a test of site of lesion. APs drawing parallel to behavioral tests. And APs growing stronger and taller with time. Coming to the first one, APs for threshold estimation, never ending innovations. We all know that, you know, we are extensively using auditory brainstem responses for threshold estimation. Prior to the innovation of auditory brainstem responses, it happened in 1967, but it was appreciated more in 1971 uh, when Jewett actually marked the uh, uh, peaks and understood that it is from the brainstem responses. Since then, it was late latency responses and middle latency responses that were playing a huge role in uh, threshold estimations. But after ABR came into existence, it has ruled uh, the clinical audiology. And till date, we don't have a supplement. I mean, we do have auditory steady state responses to some extent, but on any day, we all prefer ABRs for threshold estimation. Now, what is new in that? Now, we know that when it comes to eliciting hearing thresholds, the frequency specific information is very important, but we are all using clicks in our regular practice, routine practice. It's tone burst ABR that is the golden standard, gold standard when it comes to hearing threshold estimation, ABR for hearing threshold estimation. But even today, most of us are using clicks. The reason being the time it takes. Tone burst ABR takes nearly one and a half to two hours for us to accurately estimate the thresholds at multiple frequencies for the two years. So what we did is uh, we kind of prepared a chain stimulus. The concept of chain stimulus was nothing new. It was always there. We just took the concept of chain stimulus, prepared four tone bursts in the 202 envelope. This is a four kilohertz tone burst, two kilohertz tone burst, 1 kilohertz tone burst and 500 hertz tone burst. We chain them and you can see the interstimulus interval and the total duration of the stimulus was 19 milliseconds. Okay, so we chain the tone burst like this and try to record the auditory brainstem responses. Now, here you can see the ABRs recorded for individual tone bursts 
500 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz, and 4 kilohertz. And here you can see the ABRs that we recorded for the chain stimulus. And we found that there is absolutely no difference as we expected in our hypothesis. There was absolutely no difference between the single uh, tone burst and the chain stimulus response obtained in the chain stimulus. What is the benefit of this? Instead of spending four times the time, okay, I am able to record brainstem responses to four frequencies simultaneously. That is the advantage. That means to say the testing time for hearing threshold cuts down by almost four times. That was the advantage of using chain stimulus. Now, what I showed you here is at a higher intensity, but when it comes to threshold estimation, what's important is, can this chain get me responses the same way as that of the single tone burst at lower intensity? Yes, it can. You can see that, you know, the, the intensity is in SPL. We were able to record the auditory brainstem responses for the chain stimulus, particularly for high frequencies. Obviously, high frequencies have lesser difference between behavioral and the ABR threshold. And you can see that, you know, even at 40 dB SPL, which will be around 20 dB NHL, we could get the response. And at 50 dB SPL, which is about 30 dB NHL, we could get at all the frequencies. So this is a technique that we found that, you know, is helpful to cut down the uh, cut down the recording time of tone burst ABR by one by four times. We are all used to clicks, so it's hard to get away from the clicks. So we were thinking, you know, we should retaining the practice of recording uh, ABRs with the click. Can we do something? Now, what do we do if the click ABRs are absent? We know that click ABRs don't give information at 500 hertz uh, frequency. Therefore, to get the low frequency hearing sensitivity, we use 500 hertz tone burst ABR. So what we did is we used the same chaining concept and we chained 500 hertz tone burst clicks. These are clicks and this is 500 hertz tone burst. So simultaneously we gave this chain, the two tone bursts, uh, the click and tone burst was given and you can see the responses here. So I could get the response even at 30 dB NHL. I could get response at clicks, response for click as well as 500 hertz tone burst. So simultaneously I'm doing clicks as well as 500 hertz tone burst. This again cuts down the time by one by two. We also used another paradigm, which we called it as, uh, you know, uh, BC ABR, that is uh, binaural uh, simultaneous ABRs, wherein, you know, we uh, prepared a stereo kind of a stimulus. IHS uh, has a something called as advanced research module, wherein, you know, I can present uh, two stimulus simultaneously from the two years. That is like a dichotic stimulation. So what we did is we prepared two clicks, one starting at zero milliseconds, other starting after 10 milliseconds, because I know ABRs, uh, you know, end by 10 milliseconds. So what I did is, you know, after I started, uh, I prepared a stimulus where, you know, one is starting at zero milliseconds, other is starting as at, uh, 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 you know, uh, 10 milliseconds. And we presented dichotically, we recorded the responses and we could find that, you know, I, I was able to very accurately record ABRs for the right ears and the left ear simultaneously. Okay. So this allowed us, now generally what we do, we finish one year, hearing threshold estimation in one year and then go to the other year. So here, what we could do was right ear and left ear ABR thresholds could be obtained simultaneously. This again could cut the time by one by two. So these are some of the, uh, you know, modifications that we made in the protocol, particularly the stimulus paradigm uh, to record ABRs quickly, to record tone burst ABR uh, very quickly. So there's no end to innovations in uh, innovations in uh, AAPs. That's what, you know, I wanted to uh, show through those slides. We all know that AEPs are also used as, as, a set, uh, as a test for cytofletion. We know that ABRs have got uh, sensitivity up to uh, about uh, 70 to 80 percent when it comes to detection of acoustic neuroma. And if you use stacked ABR, which is little elaborate uh, a technique, 
if you use tag DBR, the sensitivity can go even up to 90% for detecting the acoustic neuroma, and it can even detect small sized acoustic neuromas. So here is a case that I have used to demonstrate that AEPs can be a wonderful technique for detection. Now, AEPs in general are good techniques. Among them, one that are used more for the cytoflegion testing are ABRs and ALLRs. So what I'm demonstrating through a case example, which we saw recently was, uh, is based on the auditory brainstem responses. So here is a case who, have got, who has got normal hearing in the right ear, but slight hearing loss in the left ear. We did speech audiometry. Everything in speech audiometry was fine. SRT was slightly elevated, but that matched with whatever pure tone thresholds was there. Speech identifications were 100% in both the ears. When we recorded ABR, we got auditory brainstem responses in the right ear with normal latencies, normal interpeak intervals. Whereas when we did ABR for the left ear, the ABRs were absent. I don't expect a person with probably minimal to mild hearing loss, having 100% speech identification scores in quiet to have absent auditory brainstem responses. Having this kind of an audiological profile, we suspected RCP and we referred them for neurological evaluation. Neurologists referred for an MRI and you can see that there's a large brainstem tumor. Okay, so there was a large left vestibular schwannoma seen in the MRI. Now, there's something that unique that you see. One, because of the large acoustic neuroma on the left side, obviously it has uh, kind of, you know, affected the auditory brainstem responses. That's why, you know, I saw ABR absent on the left side. Apart from that, it is also distending the brainstem. It is, the, it is pushing the brainstem to the opposite side. So what we did is we did a follow-up ABR after a few days and what we found was the later ABRs were almost same as earlier ABRs, earlier peaks in terms of their amplitude. But when it comes to latency, earlier peaks were at normal latency, later peaks were delayed. You can see here the third peak was at 3.62, whereas the fifth peak was at 6.07. Of course, left ear ABR was absent, but here the third to fifth interval also was prolonged, abnormally prolonged. Now, this is what we call as contralateral effect of ABR. A lesion that is there on the left side is also affecting the ipsilateral ABR of the opposite side. We, whenever we suspect acoustic neuroma, or we suspect RCP, we do ABR of the opposite ear, even if the hearing thresholds are normal. The reason is we look for the contralateral effect of ABR. If there's a contralateral effect of ABR, it means to say there is a large tumor that is distending the brainstem. In short, ABR is a very sensitive technique for detecting acoustic neuroma. There's another thing that I wanted to tell you here. When it comes to cytoflegion testing, these days we use a lot of VEMS. If you look at the internal auditory meatus, in the internal auditory meatus, we have inferior vestibular nerve, superior vestibular nerve, we have cochlear nerve, and we have facial nerve. Among these nerves, the acoustic neuroma is more prevalent in the inferior vestibular nerve. Now, if it does not impinge on the cochlear nerve in its initial stages, we may not find any abnormality in the auditory brainstem responses. Therefore, if you use VEMP, which checks for the inferior vestibular nerve, we will be able to detect acoustic neuromata earlier stage. So we have gone forward. It's not just auditory brainstem responses. Now we also have VEMPs that can actually tap the functioning of the inferior vestibular nerve and in turn help us detect the cytoflation at the earliest. Now, drawing parallel to behavioral tests, what do I mean by this? When I take behavioral tests, I have behavioral tests for almost everything. I have behavioral tests for hearing thresholds, I have behavioral thresholds for uh, uh, behavioral tests for uh, identifying the recruitment, 
to identify the neural adaptation. I have tests for auditory dyssynchrony. I have tests to tap tumors. I have tests to tap uh, central auditory processing. I have tests to tap uh, candidacy assessment of hearing aids or cochlear implants. Benefit that is derived from that. I have tests that tap cochlear dead regions. I have tests that, uh, that tap temporal resolution, binaural integration. So I have behavioral tests for everything. The point that I'm trying to say when I say drawing parallel to behavioral tests is we have electrophysiological counterpart for each of these behavioral tests. That's the beauty of electrophysiological tests. It gives you freedom to make modifications to the stimulus paradigm, modifications to the acquisition paradigm, and you can tap, tap whatever auditory process that you want to tap. Whether it taps the same way as that of the behavioral test, that's a thing that needs to be deliberated. But we have electrophysiological counterpart for every behavioral test that we use in the audiological test factory. To give you examples, we know that autoreliated responses are used for hearing aid benefit. One second. Okay, auto late latency responses are used as an index of hearing aid benefit. I have a study by one of the madam published in 2021. I picked up this study specifically because it talks about the individual data. See, there are many who complain that, you know, electrophysiological tests are only good to show the group differences. And when it comes to individual case, they are not sensitive enough to separate the abnormal individual from the normal individual. This is a complaint that we get to hear when it comes uh, with reference to electrophysiological tests. That's not true. Here is a study where they have tried to look at the electrophysiological findings, specifically the late latency responses. You can actually see here. One second. Okay. This is P1, N1, P2, N2. Here, P1, N1, P2, N2. They have taken cochlear implant individuals, cochlear implantees, who are going to use hearing aid to the opposite ear. And they have tried to see whether hearing aid is beneficial to these individuals, whether the bimodal cochlear implantation, bimodal fitting is helpful to these individuals. So they had six individuals with them. So they recorded P1, N1 amplitude and N1, P2 amplitude. So the first row shows P1, N1 amplitude. Second row shows N1, P2 amplitude. Just look at the first row. That should be sufficient because, you know, second row conveys a similar thing. So these three individuals, these three individuals who showed benefit with the hearing aid, who showed benefit with the hearing aid in the behavioral testing also showed improvement with the improvement in the late latency response amplitude. Whereas these three individuals who did not show benefit with the hearing aids in the speech testing did not show improvements in the cortical responses. So cortical responses objectively will reflect the benefit with the hearing aid. In this case, they have tested benefit with the hearing aid and benefit with the bimodal fitting. So it is helpful even at the behavioral test. You just have to make the right choice of the electrophysiological test. We did make an attempt to see whether hearing aid acclimatization, we all know this concept of hearing aid acclimatization. That is once we give a hearing aid to a person with hearing loss, when he starts, because it's a new acoustic environment for him, he is not getting the best of the hearing aid. And with experience of listening through the hearing aid, subsequently he'll start his listening performance starts improving. There are various studies on hearing aid acclimatization, and they say some say you know the, by one month it is a hearing aid acclimatization is complete. Some say it takes up to six months. So we try to see whether late latency responses reflect the improvements with hearing aid acclimatization. And what we found is there was improvement in the speech perception abilities with hearing aid acclimatization. There was also improvement in the late latency responses. We could find a significant difference in the P1 latency with 
there was a decrease in the p1 latency with this was on the day of hearing aid fitting this is one month after the hearing aid fitting this is two months after the hearing aid fitting and we could find that there is a significant decrease in the latency of the p1 of llr with hearing aid acclimatization again it is reflecting what is seen in the speech perception abilities this is another study where auditory brainstem responses are used to tap the temporal resolution we all know gap in noise test so they have tried to use a gap in noise uh, paradigm okay so they presented noise continuously and while they are presenting noise continuously they introduced gap okay so this gap was of different duration sometimes this gap was uh, one second sometimes this gap was 2 milliseconds sometimes 3 milliseconds 5 milliseconds and 15 milliseconds these are the various gaps they have used and they have tried to see whether there is any abr getting generated here now if the gap is not perceived what happens because it is a continuous noise you don't get any auditory brainstem responses if the gap is perceived for the onset of this noise after the gap there will be auditory brainstem responses so they have seen that if there is a if there is a gap in the noise of 3 milliseconds or more there would be a very good auditory recordable auditory brainstem responses which they could not find for a 2 milliseconds gap same thing they have found in infants also they have tried to correlate the psychophysical uh, gap in noise ability and the abr uh, gap in noise uh, finding and what they found is there was a significant correlation between the behavioral gap in noise ability and the gap in noise found in auditory brain stem responses so you can tap even temporal resolution objectively we all know that we use dead regions uh, we use ten test for the detection of dead regions threshold equalizing noise test for detecting dead regions of the cochlea here is a study by kang et al who used acoustic change complex for he made a electrophysiological paradigm uh, using threshold equalizing noise and he recorded the acc for normal hearing group hearing impaired group and cochlear dead regions group and what he found is the 10 threshold was significantly higher for cochlear dead region cases compared to hearing impaired cases and normal hearing cases so even cochlear dead regions can be objectively tapped they used two frequencies 1 kilohertz and 4 kilohertz and what they found is even cochlear dead regions can be tapped objectively using acoustic change complex the beauty of this study is they have given the individual data so it's not a group comparison yes of course here it is a group comparison here they have given individual data and even in the individual data you see that the cochlear dead regions are way separated compared to the other cochlear hearing loss group and the normal hearing group so every individual with cochlear dead region can be accurately identified using this unique paradigm of acoustic change complex can aps be used as an index of capd you all know that there are many many studies in the behavioral test how do we do we know that individuals with capd have no problem in the quiet conditions or in the conducive conditions but if the auditory system is challenged by manipulating the stimulus paradigm for example a dichotic paradigm or speech perception in noise or maybe by using a compressed speech so when you challenge the auditory system it taps the complex auditory processing and that's when you get to detect these individuals with uh, uh, central auditory processing disorder even in electrophysiological test with beat abr llr p300 mismatch negativity it's been found that whenever you manipulate the parameter to make the listening task more complex you do get to detect individuals with cap there are several these using all kind of aeps wherein they have shown they have, they have demonstrated that you know 
CAPD can be detected accurately using AEPs. Whether it can be detected at the individual when it comes to CAPD, that's again an uh, issue to be deliberated. The last thing that I wanted to talk was AEP is growing stronger and taller with time. We know that, you know, beat any test, it has to evolve with time. And when it comes to artery evoke potentials, the protocol or the overall test battery that you use for detecting the conditions has evolved with time. Way back, probably in uh, 1970s and 80s, to detect Meniere's disease, we would use SPAP ratio in ECOG. Those who have recorded SPAP ratio would know that to identify summating potential, to record summating potential and to identify summating potential, it's not a joke. So first of all, recording successfully the summating potential is not an easy task. And then analyzing the summating potential is also a challenge. With all these challenges, the sensitivity and specificity of SPAP ratio in detecting Meniere's disease is known to be poor. The sensitivity is around 50% if you don't want to compromise the specificity. Okay, if you plot an ROC curve, the specificity, if you keep at 100%, sensitivity of SPAP ratio to detect endolymphatic high drops is around 50% only. Now, what do we do? That means to say AAPs are not helping in uh, you know, detecting the audiological disorders. So we started exploring, we in the sense, you know, general, the audiological committee or the uh, community of electrophysiologists started uh, exploring the other tests. This is a test where, you know, this is a study done at AISH. So it's Neeraj Kumar Singh who has done uh, the study uh, being the first author. So what he shows here is that WEMPs can actually detect Meniere's disease or cochlear high drops uh, uh, you know, accurately. So he has compared CHAMP and WEMP for its sensitivity and specificity. And he found that WEMPs have a specificity of 100%, sensitivity of 70% in detecting Meniere's disease, whereas CHAMP has got 100% sensitivity and specificity. Imagine a test that has got 100% sensitivity and specificity, and he has shown that it's a large group study. I think, it, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's about 47, I think, uh, uh, is the number of Meniere's disease, confirmed Meniere's disease individuals that he has used. And he found that all of them could be detected using cochlear uh, high drops uh, masking procedure. Okay, so CHAMP is a wonderful technique. CHAMP is a wonderful technique for detecting Meniere's disease. So although we don't have SPAP ratio with high sensitivity and specificity, now we have other tests, WEMPs and CHAMPs for detecting uh, Meniere's disease. He also used as part of his doctoral thesis under Dr. Animesh Burman, you know, he has done frequency tuning of WEMPs. So basically, if you record WEMPs across frequencies, you generally tend to have the best WEMPs at the low frequencies, around 500 Hertz. But in individuals with endolymphatic high drops, he demonstrated that the frequency tuning is altered. That is, it shifts towards the higher frequencies. So WEMPs, you get the best WEMPs, not at 500 Hertz, but around one kilohertz, you get the best WEMPs. So having uh, 875 as the cutoff frequencies, he showed that the frequency tuning of WEMPs can have very high sensitivity and specificity in detecting Meniere's disease. So we have evolved with time. That is what I mean by growing taller and stronger. We have evolved with time and we are finding better electrophysiological tools to detect the auditory disorders. We can also use AEPs for tapping the efferent feedback. When it comes to efferent auditory system, or efferent control of the auditory system, we have multiple efferent systems. The most, well, the most studied efferent system is the oligocochlear bundle, as you all know, and we use contralateral suppression of autoacoustic emissions to tap the oligocochlear bundle. Whereas we have other systems like corticocollicular, okay, which can actually play a role in, the, in modulating the act 
activity of the peripheral auditory system. This is one of my favorite studies by uh, Chandrasekhar Nethal. He used a paradigm similar to what we used in uh, mismatch negativity and P300. He used our regular repetitive paradigm, one that we use for recording late latency responses. That is, you know, he used a DAS stimulus, same DAS stimulus, he repeated at regular intervals. This he called it as repetitive paradigm. And then he used a variable paradigm wherein the da occurred in between the other syllables. So you can see there was there is ba, there is da dip, there is da high, do. So there are there is ga, there is ta, there are so many other syllables, and in da occurred intermittently. This he called as variable paradigm. And he found that the frequency following responses recorded for the repetitive paradigm and variable paradigm is different, which means to say the brain is able to uh, assess the stimulus probability. If the stimulus probability is high, it fine tunes the brainstem responses. FFRs are better. Okay. If stimulus probability is low, as in case of variable paradigm, the responses, frequency following responses were found to be poorer. And more interestingly, this change between variable and the repetitive paradigm was known to be or was found to be associated with abilities of speech perception in noise. So he said that probably it's corticofugal pathway, corticofugal pathway, which modulates the brainstem encoding, which in turn plays a role in speech perception in noise. What a beautiful study. And we found as, you know, as a, a study following that, we found that for this context dependent brainstem encoding of speech, the acoustic basis is the spectra of the stimulus. When we varied the spectra of the stimulus, we could find that the context dependent encoding was, uh, was present. There's another uh, pottery of potential which is used for tapping the different feedback which they call as sensory gating. Okay, late latency responses are recorded here. Late latency responses are recorded with by presenting two clicks. You can present tone burst, tone burst also. So you can use 500 hertz tone burst or you can use clicks. You can even use speed stimulus. If you look at the literature, 500 hertz tone burst and clicks are used. And you can see that here, one click is presented here at zero milliseconds. Second click is presented at 500 milliseconds. So generally we use a repetition rate that is slow when we are recording late latency responses. Here they are using two uh, clicks spread at 500 milliseconds into one. Now normally what happens if you don't give sufficient gap, cortical neurons have got a longer refractory period. So if you don't give sufficient gap, the subsequent LLR that is coming will be suppressed. This is a normal process. What happens in individuals with schizophrenia is there is no suppression or there is reduced suppression, which they call as sensory gating. So this reduced suppression is because of reduced efferent inhibition is what they call. So individuals with schizophrenia have been shown to demonstrate reduced sensory gating abilities compared to normals. So this is another electrophysiological paradigm you can use to tap the different system. That's about on the clinical side. When it comes to electrophysiological tests for research, there is no end to end. It's an ocean. You can use electrophysiological test for anything and everything. I'm just listing few studies which we have done here. We used context dependent encoding because Chandrasekhar et al. had demonstrated that it has relation with speech perception in noise. We used context dependent encoding and then we used contralateral suppression of autoacoustic emissions. And we tried to see whether context dependent encoding is better than contralateral suppression of autoacoustic emission in, in determining the variance in speech perception in noise. And what we found is better than context in, uh, dependent encoding is the contralateral suppression of autoacoustic emissions. So you can you we have also used frequency following responses to tap the gender bias in perceiving infant cry. So we all know that you know 
females respond better for infant cries compared to males. So it's been demonstrated in so many different ways. But we try to see whether frequency following responses can show differences between the non-parent males and non-parent females, people who are not yet parents, you know, whether in them, in youngsters, maybe about 18 to 22 years who are not yet married, who do not have children, whether there is any difference between males and females in their brainstem responses. So we used uh, two stimuli. One is infant cry, other one is a pure tone as a control stimulus. And what we demonstrated was between males and females, there was no difference in the FFR solicited for pure tones, but there was a significant difference in the FFR solicited for infant cry. Basically demonstrating that FFRs are better for infant cry in females compared to males, basically demonstrating there is a gender bias or there's a probably genetic predisposition in females for perception for the perception of infant cry. This is another study where uh, you know Nike, this is part of uh, 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 Nike's uh, thesis, doctoral uh, thesis uh, under my guidance and uh, where we used dichotic paradigms. Uh, before we started this talk, Dr. Ravi Krishnan was talking about uh, uh, the accuracy with which uh, uh, the volume conduction happens between generator and the electrode. And this is a study where we uh, try to tap whether dichotic stimulus when I use whatever AEPs that come, the frequency following responses that come, whether it is actually accurately depicting the binaural processing. And we found that, you know, we uh, looked at the odd harmonics and even harmonics in the spectra of the FFRs. Okay, so in the spectra of the FFRs, we looked at the odd harmonics and uh, even harmonics for condensation polarity stimulus, rarefaction polarity stimulus. We looked at the different uh, FFRs and the added FFRs, and what we found is uh, it doesn't really accurately depict the binaural processing. This is another study by uh, uh, Apeksha and uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar, wherein they used uh, P300s and LLRs for. Uh, uh, assessing the differences in the cortical activity between normals and individuals with auditory neuropathy spectrum disorders. And what they found was this is for the uh, repetitive paradigm and this is for the oddball paradigm. And they found that there was a significant difference in the cortical activity in the waves of P300. And when they looked at the scalp topography and the microstates of the cortical activity that was recorded in the EEG, uh, there was a significant difference in the cortical activity. So they found that the, the sources of the neural activity in ANST as well as in ANST is very different from the sources of activity in normal individuals. Like this, you can use AEPs for so many, 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 many different things for exploring the underlying neural mechanisms uh, that happen for various behavioral uh, consequences. It's important for us to know what is the difference when it comes to research application versus clinical applications. In research applications, you know, we appreciate if there's a mean difference. I take two groups and I compare the two groups for a particular artery evoke potential. And if I see a group difference, a mean difference or a median difference, and that shows a statistically significant difference, I'm more than happy. But when it comes to clinical application, every, the sensitivity and specificity is important. Every abnormal has to be identified as abnormal and every normal has to be spared as normal. Can an AEP test do that? Yes. AEP test can do that, but it depends upon which AEP you are picking and for which application. Don't expect every AEP to do every job. That's not a fair choice. Okay. Second thing, it should have very high test retest reliability. We have tried to record mismatch negativity in uh, normals as well as abnormals. Somehow our clinical experience has not been so good. And when we try to record mismatch negativity, Across sessions, we found that the test retest reliability of MMN is not good. 
I'm not blaming MMN. There are thousands of mismatch negativity articles with wonderful scientific evidence. So I'm not blaming mismatch negativity. What I blame is probably the amplifier that the clinical equipments have. So the amplifier that the clinical equipments have is are probably not very good to demonstrate very good test retest reliability. So if an AEP has got poor test retest reliability, its utility for clinical purposes is, is definitely a question mark. Feasibility in clinical equipments. I talked about advanced research module when I talked about the BC ABR, that is binaural simultaneous ABR. But is it feasible in the other equipments? It is not feasible in the equipment, uh, other equipments. It is possible only in the advanced research module of AEPs or probably the high-end research equipments. So for me to use an AEP for clinical applications, it has to be feasible to record accurately using clinical equipments. The, if you take ABR and LLR, ABR is a lot more accurate in terms of its temporal precision, whereas LLR is not that accurate. That's because if you look at ABR, the mean and standard deviation of the fifth peak, if you look at, it's 5.6 milliseconds plus or minus 0.2 milliseconds. So there is hardly a range of 0.6 milliseconds or maybe 0.4 milliseconds, not even 0.6, okay, 0.4 milliseconds. There is, whereas when it comes to LLR, for the same stimulus, when you record across individuals, you can have a range of P1 up to about 20 milliseconds or maybe more than that in some cases. So the normal variations in the latency and the amplitude of the AEPs have to be less if it has to prove itself as a good clinical tool. In that case, ABR stands much better compared to late latency responses. LLR, I'm not ruling out LLR as a, 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 a clinical tool. LLR is definitely a wonderful clinical tool, but when it comes to ABR, in few aspects, it doesn't do as good as ABR. But the same thing holds good for ABR also. There are many things that LLR can do. For example, the assessment of the hearing aid benefit, which LLR can do, but ABR cannot do. A large magnitude of change in case of pathology. So yes, I have a no, very narrow normal variation in ABR. But suppose if there is a neuroma or suppose if there is another neural abnormality, does that individual show a large variation compared to normals? That's important. And that happens in many of the AAPs. Therefore, AAPs, many AAPs are very good sensitive tools for uh, detecting auditory abnormalities. With that, I end my talk with these take home messages. Different AEPs reflect different processing. I think all of you have seen Three Idiots movie where uh, Amir Khan says, if Lata Mangeshkar ke baap bolte tum cricket khelo ya Sachin Tendulkar ke baap bolte tum gana gao, definitely we wouldn't have seen Sachin as Sachin and uh, Lata Mangeshkar as Lata Mangeshkar and both of them wouldn't have been Bharat Ratnas. Please have the right expectation from the right AEP. That is important. Don't expect everything from every AEP. I just want to uh, play this uh, video. Can you see the uh, video, Imran? Uh, not yet, sir. Yeah, that's the most ambitious part. Maybe you have to share that screen, Sandeep. Can you see? Can you see it now? Oh, you can see, yeah. Spacecraft on a Okay, so I like to uh, 
survey, I like to suggest that please do not share. Yeah, can you see the slides now? Yes, yes. we yes. can. Okay, so the point that I wanted to make was, we have amongst us uh, many people, you know, you, who expect clinical uh, utility of AEP to be there for every AEP. See, AEPs are meant to do a lot bigger job than just restricting them to clinical utility. I know that, you know, at the end, everything has to serve as a clinical utility. But don't go with this notion that, you know, every AEP is uh, meant to be or discovered to be uh, just do the clinical work. Okay, that's what I wanted to demonstrate through that video. So it's wrong to expect the same as behavioral test. This is another important point. I see a lot of people, you know, say that, you know, my behavioral test can do this, but your AEP cannot do. Obviously, AEP cannot do because behavioral, whenever there's a behavioral task, there is cognition involved. The moment the cognition is involved, the neural uh, dynamics is completely different. So when you are recording AEPs, it is telling you some neural mechanisms, but not all the neural mechanisms that are involved in the behavioral task. Of course, you can actually improve the paradigm so that it can go as close to behavioral uh, task as possible. So don't expect, it's wrong to expect the same from AEPs as behavioral tests. There's a huge scope for innovation within your lim limits. I demonstrated that you know frequency specific ABRs and the BC ABRs, which you can record at a very fast speed. Please explore it. And at the at the end, it's only a bird's eye view of clinical and research utility of AEPs. I would say you know it's it's not even bird's eye view. Okay, it's just a talk on AEPs in forty five minutes or probably one hour uh, on AEPs. AEP is an ocean. Okay, it can't be covered in 45 minutes. So at the end of my talk also, you know, many must be thinking probably, you know, I should have covered this, I should have covered that. Even I feel that, you know, I should have covered a lot more things, but because of the time restrictions, I've restricted my this uh, presentation uh, to this much of content. Uh, I hope it was useful. Uh, over to you, Imran. Thank you all. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you. Uh so much uh, Sandeep sir I think it was really very useful uh, and as you rightly said it is very hard to um, you know cover all aspects of auditory evoke potentials in uh, in the limited time that we have but I think you did a really great job um, for all of us um, to really understand some of the fundamental aspects of auditory evoke potentials and uh, uh, obviously the aim uh, for us was just to introduce auditory evoke potentials before um, you know, we, we talk about a specific type of auditory evoke potentials, which is the frequency following response. Um, and uh, with that being said, um, I would like to introduce our next uh, guest speaker today, um, whom uh, Dr. Sandeep rightly um, addressed as one of the stalwarts in the field of auditory evoke potentials. He is... Um, in, you know, he's been an inspiration to a lot of academics and researchers and clinicians alike. Um, he is uh, the professor of uh, auditory neuroscience at Purdue, Purdue University in the US. And uh, he's done extremely, uh, you know, fascinating work with um, an auditory work potential called the frequency following response or the envelope following response. Um, I'm very sure they might be different as well. And I'm sure Dr. Krishnan, uh, whom I'm going to introduce next, uh, is going to talk more about it. Uh, so pardon me, sir, if I have uh, confused between the two. But um, yeah, he, he, is, um, he is truly an inspiration to um, not only my generation, but uh, generation before and after me. Um, <clears throat> he, he, he has published several international uh, you know publications and uh, given several talks um, and uh, um, I, I, I think words are not enough to describe uh, the extremely important work that he's done in that field um, with that being said uh, without further ado I welcome uh, Dr. Um, Krishnan uh, 
uh, who is our next speaker, and he's going to talk uh, more specifically about frequency following response and envelope following response. Um, welcome, Dr. Krishnan. Um, I'm very uh, thankful to you to accept our invitation in such short notice and, uh, you know, really, um, you know, uh, helping us with this uh, endeavor that we had. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Imran and uh, Sri Vidya for your uh, nice introduction. A um, little over the top, but uh, it always makes me uncomfortable when people praise me because I begin to wonder whether I deserve it or is there an ulterior motive? The latter is not here. Uh, before I uh, begin my talk, I'd also want to have a word of appreciation for Sandeep's uh, presentation. I think he did an excellent job of, as he said, it's a very vast area. You know, when we say AEPs, you know, you think about starting at time zero all the way to 600 milliseconds, you know, so you're capturing the entire auditory system in different time windows. So you can focus on particular time windows. But my focus is uh, pretty early in level of processing in the brainstem, but I don't think we should be thinking about processing at each level is specific to that level. What I mean by that is the auditory system is rich in both bottom-up and top-down connectivity. So I don't think the brainstem can operate on its own. It's being influenced by other components in the network, if you will. So what I'll focus is to what I think are my thoughts about where are we going with uh, maybe potential util utility of the envelope following response and the frequency following response to address some clinical questions. As Sandeep noted, I think one of the challenges is to make these measures or metrics work at an individual level because we are trying to solve an individual's problem and we are trying to tap on these responses to give us answers. And I think we do need to be careful that we don't uh, compare these measures with behavioral measures. In a way, if we do that, we are doing kind of comparisons between apples and oranges. That doesn't work out. Uh, because the neural activity underlying any of the evoked potentials along the auditory pathway is not isomorphic with perceptual measures. What I mean by that is the neural activity is limited to a small population of neurons and you're asking the tail to wag the dog. That's not gonna happen, right? So if we know that truth, we can still work within the limitations of these measures once we understand what are they telling us about the auditory system. So what I'm going to do in the next 45, 50 minutes is to talk about uh, what are the essential spectrotemporal parameters of the stimulus necessary or essential to elicit uh, face lock responses presumably originating the brainstem that can be termed as either envelope following responses or the frequency following responses. So I'll talk about the stimuli first and then talk about the response. So I've uh, listed the uh, outline. <laughs> Could people turn off the other stuff, please? This is not just anymore. You can be using phone, please. Up car better, teacher. Can the um, can Isha group turn off that the mic? Can I proceed? Hold well on, sir. Sorry about that. No, no problem. These things happen. 
please proceed, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've given you an outline here and I'm gonna pretty much follow this. Uh, I might get a little distracted and wander a bit, but I'll come back to it. Okay, uh, that usually happens in my presentation. So we'll talk about the stimuli first. What are the things we need to worry about the stimuli? Then we'll get to the response. Uh, how do we distinguish between EFR and FFR? What are they tapping? What aspect of the stimulus um, properties that they're tapping? And how do we extract the EFR and the FFR? Or how do we separate them? And I'll spend a couple of slides on the neural generators of these responses. Then I'll move on to uh, response uh, acquisition considerations and how do we analyze these responses using both time domain uh, metrics and frequency domain metrics. So I'll be introducing these concepts. I'm not expecting for you to know all of this, but at least to bring to your awareness that we have these kind of measures at our disposal to probe the auditory system. And that should uh, interest the inquiring minds. And then we'll talk about the EFR characteristics and their potential clinical applications. Mind you, I said potential clinical applications. So I'm going to be talking about things which might, which is not happening now, but which could be considered later if we have an open mind. Okay. And then I'll uh, send some data looking at uh, characteristics of the EFR and the FFR in normal and hearing impaired uh, listeners, and also uh, give you some examples of how FFRs can be used to look at uh, temporal processing capability in certain populations, mostly in language-based uh, learning disorders. And then I'll wrap up the talk with a, a summary. So how do we generate these uh, responses? Um, one thing that is important for generating this sustained phase lock responses, I mean, by the term phase locking means it's entraining. Something has to repeat with a fixed interval for the neurons to be able to entrain or lock them. Things cannot be random and as the neurons go ahead and lock and make my day. That's not gonna happen, right? So what are the kinds of stimulus that exhibit this property of periodicity or temporal regularity? Now, it could be as simple as repeating a stimulus like a tone burst at a fixed rate and you could get entraining. Okay, so you can use a click train, for example, uh, separated by 10 milliseconds that approximates a pitch of about 100 hertz, and you can get beautiful uh, envelope falling responses. But what is more commonly used for threshold measurements is the uh, sinusoidally amplitude modulated uh, tones. Basically, you're taking a sine wave, which is a carrier, and asking it to change its amplitude at a certain rate. And that would be the modulation rate or the modulation frequency. I'll show you some examples. We can also use multi-component complex tones with multiple harmonics. And when you keep adding harmonics to uh, a signal, then it becomes a complex sound by definition. And then you have an envelope periodicity to it. There's another class of stimuli, which you might not be aware of, which doesn't have a pronounced envelope, but nevertheless, it's a good stimulus to look at pitch encoding, and that is called the iterated ripple noise. In short, iterated ripple noise is basically you take a random noise and delay it by a certain amount and add it to the original. Let's say you take uh, this noise, delay it by 10 milliseconds and add it to the original. And you keep repeating this process, by the time you get to about eight or 10 iterations, you begin to hear a pitch corresponding to 100 Hertz because you produce a temporal regularity in the stimulus. It's different from a complex tone. It's different from any other sinusoidal stuff. So it creates a ripple spectra. And that's why it's called a iter iterated ripple noise. 
You can also use amplitude and frequency modulation together because some of the earlier SSR works, they combine both amplitude and frequency modulated continuous tone. So when you think about frequency modulation, if you think about speech as a signal, it has both amplitude and frequency modulations, right? See, amplitude modulations are the fluctuation in amplitude over time. Whereas within that, if you look at the uh, fine structure of the stimulus, you have frequency changes, what we refer to as what? Formant transitions, right? So it's possible that you can create artificial stimulus that combines both amplitude and frequency modulation in an effort to approximate speech-like sound. So uh, when we use these kinds of sounds, we can more accurately control the parameters so, and systematically ask questions about the auditory system. Mode of presentation, you can present these stimuli continuously or more typically as bursts at a certain rate. So that's about the stimulus and I'm going to show you some examples. So what is shown here on the top left are a series of amplitude modulated, a 4,000 Hertz amplitude modulated sound. And you can see that there is periodicity, right? There's an envelope. And below that is the spectrogram. And you see that blue line at the bottom that shows you where the envelope frequencies or the envelope periodicity. In this case, the each of the bursts are separated by about 10 millisecond. So you'll hear kind of a hundred Hertz, but it'll be high pitch because the carrier is 4,000 Hertz. So that's uh, what we use for SSR. We change the carrier frequency and we change the modulation frequency. So any complex sound you think about has these two elements, right? It has an envelope. When we say I'm talking about complex periodic sounds. So they have these two attributes. One is a slow varying envelope. We call the envelope periodicity. And that's what you see in this SAM tone that slowly varying each of those black bursts. You can kind of draw a line around each. And that would be the envelope periodicity. And there's also a rapid varying. If I were to expand each of those black diamond parts, what, will, what I'll see is a very rapid change, changing sinusoid, or in this case, the 4,000 Hertz sinusoid. So that would be the temporal fine structure. So the auditory neurons can lock onto both the envelope, the slow changing, in this case, 100 Hertz. So you'll get a response that is following the 100 Hertz, but in this example, since the frequency is 4,000 Hertz, you're not gonna get any phase locking to the fine structure because it exceeds the upper frequency limit for neural phase locking as far as the FFR is concerned, but that would be the FFR phase. If I were to use a low frequency uh, SAM tone, then you'll definitely see responses to the fine structure as well. There's another kind of complex sound with the same periodicity. And here it's just a matter of adding multiple sinusoids. In this case, I've got about, uh, it goes up to 2,500 Hertz and each component separated by 100 Hertz. And you get this sort of waveform. While the waveform is very different than the SAM tone, the periodicity is still 100 Hertz because the time interval between those each in each cycle is 10 milliseconds, right? So you can see the uh, spectrum on the right side for the amplitude modulated signal. It shows the carrier frequency at the middle and the side bands, one above it, one below it. And the bottom right, you see the spectrum of the complex sound I showed you on the left. And you can see the multiple harmonics going all the way out to about 2,500 Hertz with equal, equal amplitude. So in the case of the second one, you can get both an envelope following response and also a frequency following response, maybe out to about 1500 Hertz, meaning the individual components that go out to about 1500 Hertz, the neurons can face lock to those and you can see a complex uh, temporal fine structure locking to the temporal fine structure. 
Now, there are certain parameters of the amplitude modulated signal. And one is what is shown on the left is the modulation depth. In other words, as the arrow shows here going down, as you go down the figure here, you're increasing the modulation depth. As you go to the very bottom one, so the modulation depth changes from 30% to 50% to 80%. And if that arrow, it's the zero crossing line, then we say 100% modulation. So why is this important? Because you are changing the envelope Q to the neurons, right? The top left only shows a very shallow envelope. So the neurons might have a hard time locking to that signal because it doesn't see the envelope Q that readily. But as you make the depth deeper, as we go down on the left side, sorry about that, the neurons are more amenable to locking to that stimulus. So that's modulation depth. So you can actually measure the sensitivity of the auditory system by varying the depth and fixing the modulation frequency or the rate which is shown on the right. So on the right, you have three waveforms and what we have changed essentially is the modulation frequency. That is how fast is the envelope changing as a function of time. So it's going from 80 Hertz to 100 Hertz to 120 Hertz. So if you recall your ASSR measurements, we use different modulation frequencies to index different frequencies. Clever idea, right? So you can see the peaks at different modulation frequencies. And these frequencies that you see are the modulation rates or the modulation frequencies. So you now understand a little bit more about the parameters, temporal parameters of the SAM tone. Now, when you present a SAM tone, uh, as I said, depending on the frequency of the carrier, let's say for the sake of discussion that the carrier is low enough, let's give it 1500 Hertz and you're modulating this at about 100 hertz, and you're getting this on the top right, on the, on the bottom right, where it says stimulus right below that, you see three cycles of that modulation. Now, when we present this stimulus to the auditory system, we all know from your basic uh, transduction process, the auditory system, or let's say the hair cells in the auditory nerve is excited only in one direction. Uh, that we call rectification, right? So when we do the rectification, we get this response uh, that will be locked to the periodicity of the waveform, but also some additional components. Uh, I think I'm being, my slide is being covered by the people, so if they can move it, I can get to my figure. On the right side, I see Sandeep and uh, Madhuri Gore, if you can minimize that, I can have a view of my slide here. Oops. It's covering up part of... Anyway, if you look at the spectrum, the bottom right of the modulated, on the top, it's the stimulus spectrum. And in the stimulus spectrum, all you see is what? Three vertical lines. One is the carrier frequency in the middle. On either side, you have the side bands, which is because of the modulation. Now, if you look at the neural response at the bottom and its spectrum, you not only see the three lines that correspond to the stimulus, but you also see the neural response at the low frequencies, and that is the envelope following response. That is, you get a peak corresponding to the FO. Now, during the transduction process, it's not clean. Remember, the auditory system is a nonlinear system. So when we think about envelope falling responses, in addition to the peak at the FO, we also get peaks with decreasing amplitude in the spectrum at integer multiples of the FO. And you, I'm sure you've seen it and we'll see it. The peaks that are coming after the FO, they are distortion products. products. They are rectifier distortion products you shouldn't be confused that they represent the spectral components of the stimulus. No, they don't, okay? So uh, you need to be careful in interpreting that. So now we want to see how do we extract the envelope falling response and the frequency falling response. 
But before I get to that, I also want to show you a stimulus that is uh, a little bit more complicated. Whatever I've shown you before, we refer to as time invariant. That is, the frequency is not changing or the modulation rate is not changing as a function of time. In real speech, however, what you have is both the amplitude, the modulation rate, and the frequencies are changing. So here I have an example of a CV syllable, da, and the waveform is shown in A in the figure on the right. And below that is the spectrogram. And you can see in the first 40 milliseconds or so, the two dark lines, one is rising, that's the first formant. And above that is the second formant, which is falling. That is getting lower as a function of time up to about 40, 50 milliseconds. Then the two lines are like a train track, like right? they're parallel. So the first two formant frequencies don't change. That's when the vowel part of the CV syllable comes in. So during the burst, duh, that's where you see the formant transitions. And then after that, you see the vowel part, which is steady state. And below that at the bottom left shows the average spectrum of the sound. And on the right, we can also do analysis where we can pick uh, instant spectra. That is, we can go to a particular time window in the spectrogram and pull out the spectrum for that and compare it for a later. So if we do that, what will happen is we take the spectrum at the very beginning where the frequency is changing and compare it to the steady state you'll see a shift in the peaks of the location of F1 and F2. And that is what is shown on the lower right spectrum, that if we measure the spectrum at different points in time of a time varying signal, you can actually track the frequency change as a function of time, right? Now, what this allows is that we can use these responses then to understand certain aspects of processing that may be compromised consequent to a disorder, be it cochlear loss or some other central auditory processing problem, provided that these attributes of the stimulus is actually tapping those processes. And that's a big question mark, right? Okay, now we can go to, uh, clearly defining each EFR and FFR, and then talk a little bit about how do we extract each one, a little bit about neural generators, then we can move on to analysis. So if you look at the waveform data on the right, so let me first uh, describe that picture. So on the second line, you see the stimulus, which is a periodic waveform. And the red region I've shown, if you continue through the stimulus, is the envelope of the stimulus, okay? And the black regions is the temporal fine structure, okay? So above that, I've aligned the response. I've uh, kind of lost the latency and I'm just aligning it with the stimulus. What you see now is the red corresponds, red in the stimulus corresponds to the red in the response. So that robust component in the FFR about the stimulus is the envelope following response. So envelope following response is sustained face-locked neural activity that follows the envelope periodicity of the stimulus waveform, all right? Nothing more, it's just following the envelope. So if the envelope frequency is changing, guess what? The entraining, in the EFR will also change to follow that. So it follows this with a fairly high fidelity. So it's a very dependable measure. FFR on the other hand is neural face locking to the contents of the envelope, which we describe as the more rapid changing temporal fine structure. To put it loosely, it's the spectral components of the stimulus. Okay, we saw that complex down its harmonics and I showed you uh, peaks in the spectrum at 100, 200, 300, 400 and on to about 2,500 Hertz. Now that's the fine structure, right? 
So what we are saying is that when we say FFR, frequency following responses, we are specifically talking about neural face locking to the temporal fine structure. Now, I want to add, add here, the terms FFR and EFR are used interchangeably. In my mind, that's not correct. I've had long fights with uh, submissions to ear and hearing where I'm the section editor uh, to try and convince them they are not one and the same. And in some cases I win, in some cases I don't, depending on the uh, how prominent that individual is. Prominence has nothing to do with what is right and what is wrong, right? Uh, science is science. So EFR is different from FFR. I hope you understand that. So EFFR, EFR is pretty much what we are used to calling a clinical measure ASSR. Not the way it started out where it was a really steady state response where you had a series of repeated onset response and if you presented at 40 Hertz, you generated a steady state onset responses. But since we use amplitude modulated stimuli, you get a nice envelope periodicity and the neurons are face locking to that envelope periodicity. Anyway, uh, you can use the terms EFR and ASSR interchangeably. That is more acceptable to me, not FFR and EFR. Since both of these responses reflect some aspect of temporal encoding of certain acoustic features, I think it may be useful in evaluating the consequences of cochlear hearing loss or some other deficit in temporal processing along the auditory pathway reflected, or let's say if it involves the inferior colliculus to the large extent or more caudal structures, then it should those changes should manifest in these responses. Okay, before I move on to the next slide, uh, I talked about extraction of the responses. So if you're just using alternating polarity, which you're used to in recording your ABRs, but you apply it to, let's say, your consonant vowel syllables, that's what you're using because this all comes down from Nina Krauss. Uh, the DA is a very familiar stimulus. Everybody and its dogs seem to be using it. But if you use that, how do we differentiate? If you're using alternating stimuli, you're not going to be able to see the FFR because by alternating the phase, what you're going to see is the envelope will remain the same for each phase and they're going to sum and they would be the dominant component in your response. So I've shown you at the bottom in blue, when I add the responses to condensation and rarefaction, in the blue, you see the envelope and it's very clear, you can see the main peaks that correspond to the envelope. Now, if you look at the bottom most re response waveform, what we have done there is we've subtracted the two responses that is condensation and rarefaction. And what you get in addition to that envelope sort of periodicity, which kind of goes away, is the higher frequency spectral components. Okay, and later on, I'll show you a figure where you see the spectral differences between the envelope following response and the frequency following responses. So let me spend a few minutes on neural generators. Now, unfortunately, if you're using amplitude modulated tones, the neural generators depend, the site of generation of the EFRs depend on the modulation frequency that you use. For very slow modulations below about 40 Hertz, you're primarily tapping cortical generators. Uh, when you increase it to about 50, 60 Hertz, you might be seeing some thalamic level responses or the projections from the thalamus to the cortex. Uh, but if you wanna look at with certainty the brainstem, then you need to be fairly high in your modulation rates. Uh, it says 80 here, but I would be more comfortable if it's 100 and a little bit higher because there is some MEG data recently that seem to suggest 
that even at the cortical level, we could be phase locking to 100 hertz uh, envelope periodicity, which uh, I'm very skeptical because there's no single unit support for cortical neurons that can follow that high. And the MEG just looked, looks at tangential dipoles and you cannot rule out that it's picking some uh, subcortical responses. So when we apply, as I'll show you in the next slide or so, we think that the FFR uh, 80 Hertz and about is predominantly from the brainstem and more caudal structures. So when I say caudal structures, you know, there could be contributions from the auditory nerve from other structures along the brainstem below the inferior colliculus. But the prominent correspondence to whatever data is out there is to the inferior colliculus. The upper frequency limit for the FFR uh, is about 18 to 2000 Hertz. Now I say this, but beyond about 1200 Hertz, the peaks are very, very small getting almost to the noise floor. So you do have to get a lot more sweeps to extract these guys. Okay, so for EFR, you use alternating polarity. And for FFRs, you can use single polarity, but then you have the risk of seeing both the envelope response combined with the FFR, but the envelope response dominates, so you lose. Best thing is to do the compound histogram technique, and that is subtracting responses to the two different polarities and thereby extracting just the frequency following response and losing the envelope following response. The upper frequency limit depends on where you are because the auditory nerve, the frequency limit for phase locking is 5,000 and my kinds, my colleague seems to think it could be even higher at the auditory nerve. But as you ascend the auditory pathway through the brainstem, this steadily drops. So by the time you come to the brainstem, inferior colliculus, we see it's only out to about 1800 Hertz and that is a stretch quite frankly. And by the time you get to cortex, it's about 100 Hertz. You know, so they're lousy and trainers of higher frequency. The cortical neurons are much slower. So we have to keep this in mind when we set up a protocol to record what you think is a brainstem response. Now, this is a source localization uh, publication from my colleague. By the way, I'm proud to say he was my PhD student and graduated from my lab, Gavin Biddleman. And so we asked the question here after the MEG studies about, you know, does the cortical uh, level actually contributing to any of the uh, FFRs? So what he did was to record these responses and do a continuous EEG with uh, 64 electrodes and do a source localization. And what is shown on the right are the source waveforms at the top and their respective spectra. One on the left is the primary auditory cortex, one in the middle is the IC, and one to the right is the auditory nerve. It is clearly evident that the prominent, predominant response, both in terms of response waveform that's in the gray at the top in the middle panel. And the spectrum below shows all the harmonics in addition to the fundamental frequency. This is the, uh, whereas the PAC shows primary auditory cortex shows a very light trace of the response pretty close to the noise floor. And there's also component a contribution from the auditory nerve. So the EEG studies by and large do not support the MEG, the couple of MEG studies that seem to uh, suggest that cortical neurons can follow higher frequencies. Uh, 
So we are not too convinced about that. But if you want to play a safer hand, what you can do is you can set your FO to a slightly higher frequency, let's say 150 Hertz. And by then you know, there cannot be, nobody can refute that the cortex is still engaged. Now, when I say the cortex is not contributing, it's not contributing to the envelope or the frequency falling response. But I'm not saying that the cortex is not part of the circuitry that could modulate in an efferent fashion the subcortical FFRs. And that's the basis for most of our research that have shown uh, experience dependent plasticity for pitch when we compare Chinese listeners with English listeners for Chinese lexical tones. That's a different area. I was hoping to combine that here, but it's too much. So maybe I should give a different talk on the research aspect. So what are some of the uh, acquisition considerations and the analysis methods? We just check and see how much time I want to spend. It's already 440, but then uh, Sandeep has taken some of my time, so I'm at liberty to continue, I guess. Uh, but I'll quickly show some of the acquisition parameters. Now, I'll just, to save time, I'll just simply say, it is as simple as recording the ABR. The only difference is because you're going to use a longer stimulus, your repetition rate has to be slower a bit, okay? And since you might get a little bit higher frequencies if you're doing FFRs, you wanna make sure your sampling frequency meets the Nyquist limit. That is, in order to sample adequately, you should be using a sampling frequency that is at least twice the frequency of the highest component in your signal, okay? Everything else is straightforward here, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. Uh, you can do multiple channel recording. I've identified three channels here, but you can also do continuous recording, offline averaging, and if you're interested in source localization, then that's the way to go, okay. So I'm sorry, unless the people ask me question later on, I can address them, but I'll move on. Uh, now I'll spend a little bit of time on the analysis method. So there are several time domain and frequency domain uh, analysis methods. The simplest, so I'll talk about the time domain first and then move on to frequency domain. The simplest would be to measure the amplitude, the RMS amplitude of the signal, but the RMS amplitude will only provide you a gross measure. And if there's a lot of variability, this might not be that useful. Some people have used it, but I don't recommend that you use it, okay? A response latency, I'm not sure, uh, you know, you cannot measure the response latency per se of the EFR. You can get what are called group delays and talk about latency in that fashion, but I won't spend too much time on that. Why they use response latency here is that when you use a CV syllable like da, it's got an initial burst, right? It's an onset. And that evokes an onset response. You, so you get at the beginning before the sustained envelope falling responses. And if you extract the FFR, you get an onset response that resembles wave five. So you can measure the latency of that. Uh, I'm not big on that, but some clinicians use that more power to them. Uh, the other thing commonly done is to correlate the stimulus waveform with the response waveform. This makes good sense, right? right? The rationale is very simple. If the FFR is sustained phase locking and it's giving you a replication of the stimulus waveform with great fidelity, then the correlation between the stimulus and the response should be high. So any neural problems that disrupt neural face locking or the neural synchronization associated with neural face locking will reduce this correlation. And then you can use that as a metric to say something about uh, temporal processing being compromised because of this disorder, right? So that makes sense. Then there are some more sophisticated uh, temporal measures. One is the autocorrelation and the 3D version of that. 
is the autocorrelogram. And I'll share some examples of that. So the autocorrelation and its relative, if you will, autocorrelogram. When I say autocorrelation and autocorrelogram, it's as if I'm comparing like FFT and the spectrogram. FFT is just two dimensional. Spectrogram, the frequency domain is three dimensional, right? Similarly, autocorrelation function is just two dimensional and autocorrelogram is three dimensional. You'll see it in a little bit. So what it provides us is a measure of the periodicity strength in the neural response. If you ask the question, how good is the face locking? Then this measure could give you that. We call it a measure of periodicity strength. Greater the peak of the ACF, greater the periodicity strength. So you can look at how does the periodicity strength change, let's say in some population compared to normal. And that gives you some indication of uh, how good is the temporal processing. Most commonly what you've seen is either a phase coherence measure or a phase locking value. So this is also another way of looking at, time domain way of looking at how good is the phase locking. So what it says is that neural phase locking, if you take half a period of the stimulus, does not exactly lock to a particular position on the stimulus waveform each time. There's some variability, okay? And we call it jitter, okay? But anything that exceeds the jitter, then it's abnormal, right? Because we won't get good uh, phase coherence. And I'll show you some examples. I'm saying in a minute, it's coming up. I'm not making false promises here. Okay, so that's the time domain measurements. So now we have the frequency domain that is looking at the magnitude spectrum. That is, what is the amplitude of a sound as a function of frequency? So you're used to looking at spectrum, right? And also you can take the spectrum of the stimulus and correlate it with the spectrum of the response. So if there's a good representation of the spectrum in the neural activity, then the correlation should be good. So if you go to hearing impaired individuals, if you're looking at FFR, since they have abysmal uh, neural encoding of temporal fine structure, the correlation between the FFT of the stimulus and the fine structure would be terrible, right? I'll show you some data. I'm, I keep promising I'll show you something. I hope I do. Uh, otherwise, you'll all be mad at me. So uh, I'll kind of uh, not spend much time. I've already described what is RMS. So basically, you, you're doing some math gymnastics. So what you're doing is you're taking the instantaneous values of the response, squaring them to lose the sign, and then uh, taking the square root, and the average of that would be your RMS. Root mean squared amplitude. Okay, as simple as that. Now, autocorrelation function. So you see the waveform on the right, right? It's got a nice periodicity. Now, if I were to take that waveform and delay it by some time, and looking at the correlation with the delayed versions of the waveform, that correlation between the two will keep changing, going from zero to one. When you get one is when there is nice overlap temporally between the delayed response and the undelayed response, right? So in this case, you're showing a nice peak at about 10 milliseconds, and that is the autocorrelation peak. In this case, if it's 10 milliseconds, it's telling us the periodicity of that frequency of that uh, response is 100 hertz because 10 millisecond is the period of 100 hertz. So what we are getting is a nice peak at 10 milliseconds. And if you measure the peak amplitude of that, that would be the periodicity strength. So if it's normalized, you should go from, this peak should go from uh, zero to one. So higher the peak, greater the, better the face lock, okay. But uh, we use this uh, quite a bit in our studies, but in the clinical uh, world where they use, they seem to use uh, phase coherence or phase locking value. Uh, those are all similar uh, measures. So periodicity strength is provided by the autocorrelation function. It is the magnitude of the 
normalized autocorrelation function. So what you see at the bottom is called the autocorrelation function. So what you see on the x-axis is the time lag. And here you see on the ordinate is the periodicity strength. So the peak indicates that at that 10 millisecond delay it matches the periodicity of the envelope waveform. So the uh, correlation goes up really high, close to one. Okay. Now this kind of measure is primarily used for EFRs and it's not that useful for uh, fine structure locking measurements. The autocorrelogram I said is a 3D version of the autocorrelation function. So what you're doing is you're repeating the process over the duration of the stimulus that is deriving an autocorrelation function with sliding window. And then when you do that, you generate a three-dimensional plot, which kind of provides a picture of how face locking ability changes as a function of time and what are the different periods at which face locking is occurring. So in this autocorrelogram, the horizontal axis represents the time, the duration of the response, and therefore the stimulus time. And the vertical axis uh, represents uh, lags, okay? So 10 millisecond lag, 20 millisecond, and so on. So that's the periodicity. Uh, so I said, I compared it to the spectrum and the spectrogram. What does the spectrogram provide you? It gives you bands, right? That is frequencies where the strength is. If it's really strong band, the color gets brighter. If it's weak band, color gets lighter, right? So strong dark color to light color in a grayscale. Similarly, you can think of this as a time domain version of analysis, the autocorrelogram. Uh, so it's analogous to the frequency domain spectrogram. So it represents the distribution of all possible interspike intervals in a population of neural activity. So it could be uh, very useful. So let's look at that picture. So what I've shown you is the EFR on the left and the autocorrelogram. You can see that Across 10 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds, you can see dotted white lines where I put one over FO. So that is the face locking periodicity that we are interested in. And when you take a slice of this autocorrelogram, that is you take a time slice, what you get is the autocorrelation function, which is at the bottom showing a robust peak at 10 milliseconds. Therefore it's saying, the periodicity of this stimulus generating this, it has an envelope corresponding to 100 hertz. Now, if I were to change it to 200 hertz, this peak should shift width to five milliseconds, right? That would be the period then. Now, if you look at the uh, use of autocorrelation function, if you look at the autocorrelogram, it still has some information about periodicity that is closer to the fundamental periodicity in the fine structure. It's there, so you can see it much weaker as indicated by the autocorrelation function. The peak is almost half as what we see for the envelope, right? So uh, the ACF or this kind of metric is not really that useful for the FFR, but quite useful for the EFR. Now here comes the phase coherence. So when you plot these responses in a polar plot, it provides two pieces of information. I mean, it provides more, but let's just focus on this. So on the left, on the very top left, what you see are two arrows, one pointing to the phase angle of the vector. So depending on the intensity, frequency, the vector location, the angle subtended will be different. And then there's a magnitude. The length of that vector gives you the magnitude of the sun. So if it's high intensity, that line will increase in length. If it's low intensity, it'll converge toward the intercept. So in the middle top, what you see is a distribution of phase long. So if you repeat, let's say I'm measuring these responses, uh, presenting 100 sweeps and measuring the vector for that 100, then I present another 100 sweeps. And then if I plot the distribution of the phase locking phases, 
that's what you see, uh, fan-like distribution. So that is what we call inter-trial response phases. Now, it's still pretty good. It falls in one quadrant, so we still think it's pretty good phase locking. So if you get a kind of an average, if you will, on the bottom left, if you say I want a unitary vector representing that, this is what we get, and a little ellipse at the tip to show how much variability in the face locking is there. That small ellipse on the left means at the top of that line means it's very little variability and face locking is very good. And if you look at the telling test, the probability is less than 0 0.001. That's very strong face locking. On the other hand, if you look at the top right, it looks like spokes on a wheel, right? So half this face locking occurring almost randomly, that every time I collect data, the vector is in a different location and it produces a different angle. So now you take the resultant of all of that, what we get is a large circle that is closer to the intercept. This is very, very, very weak phase coherence. It's almost like there is no response. You know, we're getting very So we can use these kind of measures to look at how phase locking coherence, coherence or periodicity strength is changing. So that would be the metric, right? So they are very useful, these uh, time domain measurements. Now let's look at the frequency domain measurements. There are two of them. One is the FFT or the fast Fourier transform, where you're essentially saying breaking down the waveform and say, what are the constituents parts or components in the waveform? Any complex as individual sinusoids and we can separate them out and when we separate them, we can also find the magnitude of each of those component, components. And when we plot them, we call it a magnitude spectrum. Remember, when we do an FFT, it also has the phase information. We usually discard it. We are just interested in the magnitude spectrum. So you can plot it amplitude as a function of frequency. And lo and behold, you have a frequency domain. Then you can measure the magnitude of each of those peaks. And if you want to express them as magnitude ray and noise floor, you can also do that. And that'll be like an SNR measurement, right? Now, this kind of FFT is good if you have steady state. You can take an average FFT because things are not changing over the duration of the stimulus. Everything is the same. So you just take one FFT over the entire window and you're fine. No, no, no problem. But what if you have complex stimuli where the frequency is changing. You cannot do an average FFT and try to characterize the time varying properties of the stimulus. There you have to resort to what is called a joint time frequency analysis. It's like a narrow band spectrogram. So you can see how frequency is changing over time and what is the magnitude of the response over this time. Spectrogram, right? Everybody is familiar with spectrogram. So that's a joint time frequency analysis, okay? But once you have the joint time frequency analysis, you can go to specific temporal windows of interest and extract the two-dimensional two FFT and measure its magnitude and compare across populations. For example, we do this routinely because we believe we have changing pitch contours. We believe that the responses are different when the pitch is flat versus when it's accelerating. And what we have shown is when we do that separate analysis, the Chinese uh, advantage seems to be mostly in this accelerating portion of the pitch. The pitch is rising in one of their uh, lexical tones. So the changing frequency as a function of time is an important perceptual attribute for them. So uh, we can do those sorts of things. We can look at specific time components, see what's happening to encoding. For example, you could have a frequency modulated sound like, you know, frequency is changing linearly. And we want to see how good are the neurons tracking this frequency change. The spectrogram will give you a band that follows that frequency, but then you can break it down to individual time windows and compare the uh, 
uh, amp magnitude at each of those time win windows between the two populations and figure out where exactly is the difference in neural encoding between the two populations. So it's a very useful, and we have found it very useful. So from the spectrogram then, you can get what we call instant spectra. That is, you can go to a particular location and extract the FFT at that location. So here's the example of uh, comparing the frequency domain analysis of an envelope falling response on the left top. Le so let's talk about, so what is shown here at the top are the response waveforms. EFR on the, it's the same stimulus, EFR on the left and FFR on the right, right? They look very different, right? The EFR shows that nice periodicity that you're so used to, and you call them FFR or speech evoked ABR, which is also a misnomer. It's not an ABR. ABR is already taken. It's the onset responses. And this response is not specific to speech, as I, as I will show. So that terminology is entirely wrong, inappropriate. So anyway, uh, I'll come back to that. So here's the EFR, and you can see this robust periodicity. And now we look at the spectrogram, you can see nice bands that pretty much follow the fundamental frequency and integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. Now, some people early on have used the envelope following responses and talk about the multiple bands that you see in the EFR spectrogram as spectral components. As I alluded to earlier, they are not the spectral components, they are rectifier distortion products. So that would be a misinterpretation if you do that. So if you take an average uh, FFT as the case in the bottom left, because this is a steady state, actually this is not a steady state, this is a, this is a response to stimulus, duh. So, but the envelope is quite invariant because there's very little of the envelope related information during the burst interval, but rest of it, I mean, visually, if you look at it, do you find any difference in the time interval between the peaks? They look the same, right? So it's not changing, as simple as that. You don't have to do all this analysis. You look at that and say, it's a steady state because that's the vowel ah, which comes after the burst in da. So no big deal. So you get this uh, spectrum that shows the fundamental frequency and integer multiples, okay? Now, on the right, if you take the spectrogram, the low frequency components are not that prominent. But if you look at the higher frequency, that become very clearer. So because now you are responding to spectral components of the stimulus. If you look at the FFT here, you see the peaks out here all the way, which is not here in this figure on the left. And these are corresponding to the formant harmonics of the stimulus. So that's the difference between EFR and FFR. EFR, EFR is only capturing the envelope of the stimulus. In other words, the neurons are faithfully locking to just the envelope and nothing else. Okay, keep that in mind. It's not uh, locking onto the contents of the envelope, which is the temporal fine structure. But the FFR on the other hand is dominated by the uh, spectral components that correspond to the formant related harmonics, which I've identified here. No doubt that these responses, the TFS related locking the FFR is going to be an order of magnitude smaller than the much more robust envelope following responses. Okay, uh, that's a given. There's another example of the phase coherence, which shows that if you're here, we are comparing on the left is the spectrum and the right is the time domain phase coherence. What I want you to look at it is that if you, in each panel, if you compare the FFT peak and the phase R, you, what is important you should focus is that the length of the vector is quite strong, I mean, long, and the variability, the ellipse is very small, meaning that the face locking ability is very good. So there's no lot of random distribution or wider distribution 
of uh, the vectors. So now let's go and compare one-to-one -one the amplitude here in the magnitude spectrum there. Now let's see what happens when you get a weak response. When you get a weak response in the time domain analysis, the vector length decreases and the variability of phase locking increases. The, that ellipse or circle in this case has become larger, right? Now look at the FFT peak, that has become smaller too, right? It's coming closer to the noise floor. And finally, when there is no response, this is what is shown at the bottom phaser, and there's no distinguishable peak in the FFT about the noise flow. So both are comparable measures, you can use them. So now I'll get to some uh, potential clinical ap applications. I say potential clinical applications because, you know, we are in the forefront now trying to think about the possibilities. You know, we are not there yet, but we are saying, why not? Why can't we try this and see? Okay. So uh, I'm not promising that people will adopt this. Um, I have to make a comment here. Uh, I think audiological practice um, tends to continue to use procedures that the audiologists are convenient or comfortable with. They're afraid to consider new measures. Uh, case in point, uh, the use of tone burst, we can't even jump from tone burst to use of narrowband chirps, which have been shown to produce more robust responses. We are hesitant. Then why talk about uh, ABRs to envelope falling responses, the SSRs? The SSR is automated, it's objective, it tells you when a threshold is reached. There are no uh, tester errors. I mean, hopefully there are not that many errors. Experienced clinicians can handle it. But it has the advantage of providing you an additional buffer of intensity that you can tap at some residual hearing. And it takes a little bit less time. So uh, the Joint Committee on infant hearing has said, ABR is the gold standard, you know, but, you know, it shouldn't be written in stone. You should be open to new things. That's all I'll say and leave it there. Okay. So let's talk water about, bottle. hello. Where's your water? Hmm. Okay. So anyway, we've uh, talked about this. Now I'll just focus on, on uh, you know, this is what I was making this slide. I just want to make the point that when we're looking at EFRs, you see these multiple peaks on the top bottom in the EFR uh, FFT. Uh, you need to be wary and I'll repeat that. Mm -hmm. Those peaks are not spectral face locking to spectral components. They're rectifier distortion products. It's interesting. I'll show you in a little bit that these distortion products, nonlinearity, disappear when we look at the same envelope falling responses in hearing impaired. You'll still see envelope periodicity. It's a nice peak at FO, but none of the other stuff. So that also proves that it's a nonlinearity. Okay, uh, this uh, slide is to convey to you that speech is not special in terms of envelope falling response. So a lot of things have been made in different studies that, you know, you use speech ABR and you interpret it as if the neurons are responding to speech. What does the brainstem neurons know the difference between speech and non-speech stimulus when you are just thinking about periodicity? Just think about it. Uh, Nothing. So if you look at the FFRs here, now unfortunately, with these figures, there are a way to move. I cannot even see my own figure with, um, uh, is there a way to close these on the right? I can't even slide. Anyway, 
what I wanted to convey with this figure is I have these different stimuli, you know, but uh, just a complex tone and iterated ripple noise. And for most of them, the response looks the same, the envelope following response. Look at the FFT, it's the same, it doesn't change. Only for the IRN, it's different because IRN doesn't have a pronounced envelope uh, periodicity. But nevertheless, it'll show you a nice response at FO, but not as robust. So you have to be very careful as consumers of research, clinical research. You cannot take at face value, even if somebody who's a prominent author in the field, you cannot, you have to be skeptical about research products. That's my point. Uh, you have to always ask the question, why? What proof is there for this? So we did this and basically showed there's nothing special about the speech EFR or speech ABR. I think you should simply call it EFRs to complex sounds and they all look pretty much the same. So at the brain sim level, don't expect anything special. Now, if I was looking at the FFR to these responses, they look different because the temporal fine structure is very different for these sounds, right? So you look at differences, but not for the EFR. Uh, the reason I bring this up is EFR has been pushed quite a bit as being able to say, you know, dyslexic or any other processing difficulties, reading difficulties. I think that's a stretch and over interpretation. Okay, so you do have to be very careful. At least that's my opinion anyway. So some of the characteristics of the EFR here, it shows that as you increase the modulation, it's very prominent for a very low, you know, you're very familiar with the 40 Hertz response, right? It's very large for the cortical response. And as you increase the modulation rate, the amplitude drops precipitously, you know, and at high modulation rates, as shown here in the bottom, 100 to 600. By the time you get to about 500, 600 modulation, it's very hard to separate the envelope falling response from the noise floor. So this is some of the characteristics. So you need to be, you need to make sure that you're well within the operation range of modulation frequencies if you're trying to implement some clinical measures. My problem is I'm not able to see my figures. Is there a way to get rid of the uh, all the different people that shows up? Can I turn it off? Maybe okay. You can push okay. Them okay. Down. So you, you options. No, no, I'm okay. I'm okay now. I, I I managed to push them because I couldn't see the right part of the figure, so uh, I'm kind of describing everything in the blind. Anyway, I'm good, but I'm not that good. You know, um, so let's look at uh, encoding and how it might be changing consequent to a cochlear hearing loss. So this is an application, potential clinical application of use of EFRs uh, in clinical situations. So currently we don't have any uh, EFRs that are used in a routine way is measured other than the threshold determination procedures. Um, but when we think about cochlear hearing loss, what we have is a situation where the thresholds are elevated and you also get poorer frequency res resolution consequent to broadening of the auditory filters. Now, both of this could potentially alter encoding of both the envelope and also, for sure, the temporal fine structure and both of them have bearing in the perception of the sounds. So what this approach is to try and see, can you relate the degradation in representation in either EFR, FFR, or both to the perceptual consequences of cochlear hearing loss? In other words, can you uh, kind of establish a predictable relationship between degradation in uh, a neural metric and a degradation in perceptual performance. That's the long-term goal. Uh, 
but right now we are trying to understand the neural metric first and then introduce simultaneously the perceptual and the neural and see if we can compare. Okay, but let me go through this data, the EFR data. So here uh, in this study, it's one of my students who finished her PhD several years ago, looking at neural encoding in normal and impaired ears. So what you see at the top is the EFR uh, spectrogram at two levels, 70 and 80. In the normal on the left, you can see clear bands, you know, from the FO and uh, the other uh, components. When you go to the hearing impaired, even when you increase intensity, there's a slight improvement, but the band around FO is more sort of fuzzy. It's kind of broad, right? So there's uh, these subtle changes. The question now is how do we quantify these differences? So you might have to take the first few harmonics, if you will, but you realize that the when you're looking at the EFR, the subsequent peaks are only rectifier distortion products. So you do have to be careful. You can only have a descriptive work and descriptive work is not enough when you're looking at trying to manage individual cases in the clinic. So we have to come up with something better. Now, if you were to uh, take the EFR magnitude in the bottom, we show the uh, amplitude of the FO component as a function of intensity. And as predicted, it increases uh, steadily as you increase intensity. It's not surprising. Now, overlap in the gray bars are the um, FO amplitude growth in uh, hearing impaired. Now, we wanted to make sure we had the range of intensity so that comparisons can be made with equal SPL at at least some intensities. Okay, so even in the region when we have equal SPL, what we find is the responses uh, from the hearing impaired FO response are much smaller uh, compared to the normal. And it tends to grow, but the uh, growth never quite gets to where the normal is. Now, I want to make a point here and which is this kind of result is slightly, is slightly at variance with single unit data, which seemed to suggest that uh, in hearing impaired, envelope uh, encoding actually is more robust than in normals. But it's, it doesn't mean anything because it doesn't really help the impaired individual in terms of encoding certain perceptual attributes of the stimulus. So we shouldn't uh, jump up and down because it's bigger. But the FO amplitude is bigger only when the hearing loss gets more, the degree of hearing loss. It's not, actually it's worse like in our data when the hearing loss is kind of mild and nearing moderate. Okay. So you see these sort of uh, discrepancies uh, and it might, be the data that we have might be more related to the reduction in inhibition uh, and or the enhancement of the excitatory mechanisms. Now, when you have a hearing loss, there is something called uh, central denervation hypersensitivity. That is, once the output from the periphery is reduced, it alters the central gain mechanisms. So there is compensatory gain, which tries to overcome the reduced input from the periphery. So, uh, so the enhanced envelope that is seen at greater hearing loss might reflect uh, this kind of an issue where we have uh, kicked in the central gain mechanisms as the hearing loss increases and the output, peripheral output decreases. What's happening? Why is my... So staying with EFR, we can also use this. There's good promise, I think, to look at outcome measures in an objective fashion. Now, I'm proud to say this study is one from an Aish alumnus, alumni, whatever it is. I don't know if some of you remember Viji Ishwar. Uh, 
So this is her data from 2015. So what she essentially has shown here is that one of the issues of using evoked potentials to sh uh, short stimulus is that uh, it doesn't deal well with amplification manipulations, right? Because it's too short. Longer duration stimuli with uh, more time interval between them, that is longer ISI, will is better at capturing the nonlinear properties of hearing and amplification. So what these people used, uh, VG and their associates, is use longer stimuli where they made sure that this had a band which covered low, mid, and high frequencies. So they used the vowels to cover the low, mid frequencies, and they used fricatives to use the high frequencies, and they modulated each of these bands so you could generate an envelope falling response to each of these modulated bands. So there are several EFRs created in this uh, in this uh, figure, you see that there are one, two, three, six different stimuli. So just imagine there are six different EFRs. One to the ah uh, sound, one to the oo, then the F2 near the ah, uh, then the F2 near the oo, and the cha and sha sound. Okay. But their point was to use this longer stimulus and then look at unaided and aided response and see, they did several things, you know, they varied bandwidth, they looked at detectability and all that, and the number of EFRs and things like that. But I don't have time for all of that. What is clearly evident from this data is that, uh, one, when you increase the level in the unaided conditions, the uh, dark black bars and the dark gray bars, if you look across the stimulus, particularly for R, uh, it seems to increase for the F1 and F2 regions. Right, so just without any uh, aid, just by increasing intensity, and this suggests the effect of audibility. So when you make it make the stimulus more audible, things are improving. Well, amplification in a way is also that, right? You are amplifying the sound in a prescribed manner. Now, if you look at, uh, and they looked at unaided at 50 and unaided 65, and then aided for these two conditions. Uh, without spending too much time, it is very clear that uh, these responses are able to capture the effect of hearing aid process speech. That is, any improvements uh, in representation of the envelope is shown here. Now, the $10,000 question is, so what? If you show this, does it necessarily mean that these people who are showing greater improvement with aided uh, measures, their perception is better? Now, that's where I think a constant concerted effort where you look at individual by individual and begin to correlate. Like Sandeep mentioned, it's very important. You know, you can paint a nice picture with mean data, but in clinic, it has to work for each individual. But there is promise. I think you should uh, proceed with this. A similar thing can be approached with the uh, FFR, and I'll show some data with the FFR as well. Now, this is the effect of bandwidth. So basically, when you increase the bandwidth, the responses get larger. So for the sake of time, I'll move on. If you have any questions, I can answer. So EFR and FFR are normal and hearing impaired. Uh, so we know that the, so now I'll focus on mostly the FFR and there'll be some EFR. So FFR, as we have shown over the years that it does preserve uh, information about both steady state and time variant acoustic features of speech that are important for speech perception as well as pitch. And now there is growing interest in the use of FFRs to e evaluate the integrity of neural encoding of complex sounds as a metric of trying to see, you know, because face locking involves temporal processing, some aspect of temporal processing 
Uh, in different population, normal impaired ears, cochlear hearing loss, effects of age or age-related deficits, and in children with language-based learning problems, like example, uh, specific language imp impairment, where we don't find any structural changes between the two population, but clearly we find very big differences in uh, performance on language tests, a battery of language tests. We have also used these FFRs successfully to understand how language experience shapes subcortical processing of pitch relevant information and how the altered representation then drives the cortical level processing. So it's all tied in. It's as I said at the outset that we shouldn't be thinking about just the IC. We should be thinking about the entire auditory system. No doubt we are recording responses which are generated largely from the inferior colliculus. That doesn't necessarily mean it's only looking at activity from the inferior colliculus. There's both bottom-up inputs and considerable top-down inputs directly to the IC that could shape these processing. So you need to be thinking about that. We are in a network and we need to be thinking about how the network is operating. And that's something we need to try and understand as well by probing these uh, bottom up and top down and the relationship between the two. So for that, what you need to do is maybe consider concurrent recording of both brainstem responses and cortical responses that tap at the same attributes of the stimulus. So, in our case, we have been successful of finding a response at the cortical level that is pitch specific and the AFR is providing us pitch specific information. So we can compare them and see if there's any transformation in the processing from the level of the IC to the auditory cortex. So there's some examples of my initial work looking at encoding in normals. And this is what I said, if you go through this data, it's very clear that the, now, by the way, this is all fine structure or FFR data for uh, vowels U and on the right is I, and I've shown you how the amplitude of the F1 and F2 harmonics change as a function of intensity. Now, what is the takeaway from this figure is that the FFR is clearly representing certain or encoding certain acoustic features relevant to representation of formants, right? Which are very important. These are used to distinguish between speech sounds. So I think if we have this metric, then the question becomes, how does it change in different populations? And do these change mean anything with respect to perception? And that's where we need to head, I feel. Now that was steady state. You can also have a time variant signal. Here is an example, which is a very simple stimulus. This is just a tone that is changing in frequency. It's a tonal sweep. One is rising, you know, as you can see, but these are responses. Oops, let me go back here. So what I've shown you is the FFR response to a rising uh, tonal sweep, which went from 400 to 600 Hertz. And on the right are responses uh, for a tonal sweep that is moving in the reverse direction from 600 to 400. For both of them, when we look at the spectrum, it's very clear that the phase log neural activity is following the frequency change. Now, these uh, kind of trajectories that we have used here approximates the form and transition. So we need to be looking at uh, since form and transitions are important for speech perception, do the hearing impaired individuals have greater difficulty with speech because the form and transitions are not being encoded properly? So you can look at segments where there's formants which fall within the upper limit for face locking and then characterize them. So there's potential, but that thing is you have to have a systematic uh, long-term research program which kind of you have to do incremental work step by step to get at these issues. And that's my, um, I think, hope that in the future, someone will take up and do these very necessary and essential things for a viable um, clinical application of these responses. There's another application that, you know, when we are looking at distortion product, the 
DPOEs, they're not that reliable at low frequencies, right? Uh, below 1,000 hertz, a lot more variable. Now we can get the neural version of the dis distortion product. So here is we use two different tones and uh, presented them separately with the appropriate uh, ratio and F1, F2 ratio. And this is in the fine structure. So you need to look at the subtracted responses to each phase. And what you see is not only responses at the primaries F1 and F2, but you also see the distortion product and all the way down. So my point is this, uh, if the middle ear problem creates a roadblock for measuring distortion product autoacoustic emissions in the clinic, because you're looking at back propagated echoes and if the middle ear is not working well, then you're having trouble picking. So why not uh, consider using this in cases where you want to examine the nonlinearity more. For example, simpler thing would be in addition to encoding of speech stimuli, you can look at the nature of the nonlinearity encoding in normal and impaired ears or in normal in some other population and see if they're different. And therefore, does, that, does this measure allow us to separate the population and can be used as a clinical measure? Now there's also, uh, we had talked about steady state sounds. They're also in speech, there are, it's time varying, right? So when I said da, uh, bar or something, the formants are changing at least in the first 40, 50 milliseconds, at least the first two formants. But here I've used a simpler stimulus, which is a diphthong. So basically this stimulus at the top, it's going from ah to ooh in this short period of time. So you hear the perception is it goes ow, oh, ow, oh, like that. Okay, the point is, created a simple stimuli and diphthongs, diphthongs do occur in speech. So you can see that uh, when the spectrum of the spect spectrogram of the stimulus, if you look at it, during the R portion, the formants are higher. And when you get to U, the formants are much lower. So you can see the question is, can the FFR follow this trajectory? At the bottom is the FFR response, no doubt noisier, but you can see the two bands that's also progressing down and saying we can encode the changing frequency in a diff tongue. And now we can do the joint time frequency analysis. That's the spectrogram. And then we can look at specific time instance and measure the amplitude. And this would be a nice thing to look in the normals and hearing impaired or any other population. So these are potential metrics. I'm not saying all of them will work, Unless we try, we don't know. So now we look at the FFR uh, in normals, uh, EFR and FFR in normals and hearing impaired individuals. Uh, so in this data set, what we have shown is both the envelope and the TFS encoding is degraded in cochlear hearing loss. So if you look at that, Again, I've showed you earlier, it's nice bands in the spectrogram on the right for the hearing impaired, it's more kind of diffused. And now look at the spectral bands. On the, the normal hearing, they show nice distinct lines corresponding to the formants, but in the hearing, you get as kind of a smeared band of frequency on the right. So that is uh, quite clearly, if we were to look at joint time frequency analysis and take instant spectra at these frequencies, what you'll get is reduced amplitude and broader peaks. So at the bottom, you show the amplitude growth for both the uh, envelope falling response compared between the normals and black graphs and the gray is the hearing impaired. Now you have seen this before, both of them show growth, but the envelope response are much weaker for the hearing impaired. On the other hand, if you look at the fine structure information, the normal tends to increase with intensity and plateaus, but the hearing impaired, they are weaker, but they don't show any clear trend to actually improve in representation with, uh, what I'm thinking is you're improving audibility by increasing, so the intensity. So the question is, if amplification uh, essentially increases the magnitude of the sound, 
will these individuals actually get the help? If they do get the help, what else is going on? Because the encoding doesn't seem to be affected by the intensity, at least for the fine structure. So we also did equal. So when you do uh, equal SPL comparisons, there's always an argument, but you are comparing them at two different points in the uh, dynamic range. You cannot get around that problem. You know, in, in studies, when you're looking at normal and hearing impaired, the common strategy is to do comparisons at equal SPL and equal SLs. And that's what we did here with the EFR and the F1. And you can see that, again, for the EFR, no issues. The uh, amplitude goes up, and but it's very clear for the formant the fine structure, while for the normals, you show, show a steady growth as the uh, sensation level increases. For the hearing impaired, it does not change much as predicted in the previous. So persistence of degraded neural phase locking of TFS even when audibility is restored, uh, might indicate that there's a problem with uh, temporal pattern of activity uh, in the brainstem neurons. Now, this could be both related to uh, altered uh, tonotopic maps or loss of frequency selectivity. Um, so that's an issue. Now we have started looking at uh, what if we use different uh, hearing aid processing strategies? So we're using some open source software and using different prescription methods and trying to address the issue for more complex sounds. So now we are uh, looking at bisyllabic uh, non-words like ba, da, so with the separation. So if you look at the envelope, so I call the term unprocessed, mean it's not uh, processed through a master hearing aid or simulated hearing aid, if you will. And process means it's through the output going to the earphones is through the processor. So if you look at the bind or the envelope, it's very clear that there's nice envelope following response. This in the uh, normal hearing uh, and for each of the syllables. And then uh, in the process, these bands get to get a little bit brighter that's not surprising, you are increasing the intensity and you see a few more lighter bars. Now in the hearing impaired, what you see, the spectrogram, it's very clear, strong, robust F4 following. You know, it's following the periodicity, but we don't see this multiple rectifier distortion products. This was this what I was alluding to. But when you send it through a processor, they're coming back slowly, albeit it's not as bright as the normals, but it's slowly coming back. Okay, so there is some hope. So these kind of measures might give us some idea about why does some individuals benefit from amplification while others don't with equal hearing loss. We can compare the encoding and if we show that the individual is not benefiting from amplification uh, as a poor encoding, in this case of envelope uh, relevant information, then we can say maybe what is our processing strategies to uh, represent the envelope? So that should be kind of thinking that we need to proceed with. Now, this is the FFT. So you can see that very clearly for a bond, uh, uh, you know, the fundamental frequency here. So what we have uh, is unprocessed and processed for bar on the left. So with process, the amplitudes are going up slightly for the normals and da the same thing, you know, on the right, you know, unprocessed and processed. But look at the uh, hearing impact. Now, if you notice, I've made a maximum, these numbers are very small. So I put the maximum here on the vertical axis at 0.05. And here's 0.12. So the envelope does go up higher than the normals in this case. So the individuals we tested now with this new study, one of my doctoral students, she's doing her dissertation, is we are showing enhancement of the FO. But look at the big difference in the spectra of the rectifier distortion products. There's absolutely, other than this next peak, there's nothing, right? 
And even when we process it, they're not getting any better. You know, although in the spectrogram, I was hopeful that I was seeing something that's getting better, but the envelope is retained, but nothing much. So one way to interpret this, I mean, it's a nonlinearity is lost, so you don't see the rectifier distortion products. So that would be the easiest thing to do. Can't think of anything else, you know. Okay. Now you looked at the EFRs on the left already. Now I'm gonna focus, and then you have a way of comparing the two so you get an idea. So on the right is the FFR for the same bud. Uh, so now you can look at the prominent bands in the high frequency. Look on the left here. There's actually nothing here in the high frequencies near the formants. When you go to the FFR, there's very clear bands, very robust for bi and da that correspond to the formant frequencies of bi and da. It's there uh, in the unprocessed and it seems to get a little bit better although unless we quantify it, it's still early stages, uh, it is, uh, seems to be you know, very clear. Now in the hearing impaired, uh, we have already gone through this where we saw the robust envelope blocking. And when you go to the temporal fine structures, there's hardly anything other than some band here. Now, if you squint your eyes and see there might be something here closer to the first formant, and when you process it, it's getting a little bit stronger, but, you know, uh, we really have to work on this and show convincingly that the hearing, hearing aid processing actually recovers some of the temporal fine structure information. So that's where we are at in trying to figure out what is it that we can do. The goal is to see if we, can we, develop this as a metric to guide optimal signal processing strategies for hearing aids at an individual level. In other words, if we get a, uh, let's say this is a subject and we get a result like this, is there something that we can do by tweaking the signal processing strategies in the hearing aid to recover some of the fine structure information? You know, and can, so if, if we can, and if that improves, perceptual performance, then we have a nice little test to do this in every individual. We can also look at outcome measures after some time of use with the hearing aid to see if anything has changed because experience does uh, make things better in a malleable system. This is just the FFTs for the same. So you can see it's very clear that you have the first and the second formant information peaks very clear. Uh, in the unprocessed and processed for the normal. But for the hearing impaired, uh, there are some peaks, but uh, I'd be sticking my neck out to say anything about whether the formant relevant harmonics are present. But when you do show the processing, the first formant information here and the second formant information here, slowly coming back up. But I think maybe a little bit of wishful thinking on my part, but it's there. I mean, I'm not, uh, making this up, but we have to look at many more subjects and see if in fact these kind of metrics will help us in our clinical decision making. Now, this is an example of how we use these responses to look at uh, temporal processing. We compared uh, kids with specific language impairment and normally developing kids. So in specific language impairment, there's a language developmental delay with no structural or any other aspects. In any other aspects, both the groups are comparable. But uh, so there is data out there somewhat um, confusing with some say, you know, there are temporal crossing difficulties, others not so. So we, several years ago, this is one of my past PhD students, we were interested in saying, what if we use simple tonal sweeps and make the change in frequency faster and faster? You know, So we changed the trajectory. So you see the stimulus here, a very small change at the top. And then slowly you can see that the line goes a little bit more tilted. So we are going from 1,000, 1,333 hertz per second to 
to almost 7,000 hertz per second. So we are changing the rate of change of frequency in the tonal sweep. So we have the up sweep and a down sweep. So uh, the dark traces in the FFR waveform, the next column is the normal and the gray one is the SLI kits. So if I look at the waveform, I can make a comment where the responses are different, but mostly comparable for the lower sweep rates, but only when you get to high uh, sweep rates between 5,333 and 6,667, then I begin to see a deterioration in the ability of the neurons to follow the changing frequency, which is true for both rising and falling. There seems to be an asymmetry in that the falling seems to be more difficult for the uh, SLI kits compared to the uh, normals. So in the spectrogram, you can see the bands like you saw in the stimulus, right? So if you look at the next column, you can see a streak going up for each of the, and until you get to the very high rate, sweep rate at the bottom of each uh, main panel, now you don't see the following of that uh, frequency change. So it's not tracking. That's for the rising at the top. And immediately below that, it's for the falling sweeps. And again, you can see by the time you get to about um, 3000 or so, you're beginning to lose it. And now we can look at the amplitudes of these. I'll skip this spectral. These are instant spectra taken at three different times for each of those sweeps. But let's come to the uh, directly to the amplitude derived from this spectral data, instant spectral data. So if you look at that at each point, so the top one is for the rising and the bottom one is for the falling and each panel is a different point in time along the sweep. Uh, so what is consistent is that the amplitudes of the responses for the SLI kits are about the same at very slow rates and begins to diverge, meaning it gets smaller and smaller compared to the normal kits as you increase the rate of the uh, sweep uh, changing frequency. And it's true regardless of which time we are looking at it. All the three time instants show the same thing. We find something similar you know, for the falling, but we don't see the convergence of the two amplitude functions at the low uh, rate, except for this one time. If you look at these two times, they're still kind of parallel. So there seems to be a difference or an asymmetry in the way the SLI population is behaving for rising and falling sweeps. The rising sweeps are much more robust in that it provides a compression and doesn't spread the traveling delays in the cochlea and you get a much better response. But when you go the opposite way, it creates more problem. I'm wondering if that's what causing the SLI kits a little bit more difficulty because of the dispersion of the times at which uh, each of those frequency regions are engaged optimally. So uh, that's pretty much it. In summary, uh, I think if, if you understand these responses and know their limitations, it could be a very useful metric uh, for objective analysis of clinical data. Even that with time, I think we can get to the individual level. Uh, so we can look at not only integrity of neural encoding of complex sounds, but how you can recover some of this encoding with um, targeted amplification schemes. And then we can use it as a measure of outcome in different individuals, which then could drive the signal processing strategies that is specific, specifically optimal to a particular individuals. So then we can make specific recommendations of prescription that will produce the best encoding. And we are assuming if it produces the best encoding, uh, the likelihood is that the performance should be better also. Now that is the loose end we haven't gotten to. So subsequent experiments should diligently look at this 
and add the perceptual measure to this, okay, and compare them. It's not easy, but you gotta start somewhere. Now, the FFR measures can also be used uh, for training related achievements. So you can do piece, pre and post training uh, measures of encoding and to show improvement from training. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, benefits from amplification. The application of these responses with cochlear implantation is um, challenging because the cochlear implant is a large satellite <laughs> with artifact. So they've used some subtraction techniques, but I have stayed away from it uh, because it's not an easy problem to conquer. No, the, the bottom line is you have to come up with methodologies and analysis that doesn't scare away the, away the clinicians and it's useful to answer their clinical questions for improving, for the benefit of the client. You cannot you know, have things with loss of whistles and bells and having difficulty interpreting and administering and time consuming, you simply cannot have that in a clinical situation. So my suggestion would be to understand these responses and their limitations, and then to pursue uh, incremental parametric evaluation of neural representation of different acoustic features and with different parameters and try to establish the relationship between neural encoding and manipulation of parameters. And then to relate this to auditory perceptual abilities. And once we finish this picture, I'm not making light of it. It's a daunting task, but if you just sit and say, and twiddle your thumbs and say, can't do it, uh, that's where we'll be. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. We have a few questions. Sure. If you are comfortable, I can. You want to take a break? Bring some. No, water. no, no. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, a few questions for um, Dr. Sandeep, and he's been answering on the chat uh, while uh, it was going on. So, okay. I think I'll take your questions. Uh, we have uh, from uh, Mr. Guru Prasad. He says, how do the EFTs and FFTs impact the cochlear implants where the basilar membrane is nullified? What is the question again? Uh, sir, how do the EFTs and FFTs impact cochlear implants where the basilar membrane is nullified? You mean EFRs and FFRs? Correct, EFRs and FFRs. Oh, okay. I mean, just because the cochlea is uh, nullified, we are hoping the cochlear implant is doing its job, right? Yeah. So it will still be it will still be driving the auditory system. So we need to characterize using those responses how subsequent levels in the auditory system are representing certain acoustic features. So, but there are some constraints, right? If you look at an electrical response, their dynamic range is smaller than the acoustic response. But it's still doable, you know, as I said in the previous slide, it's very challenging first to overcome the issue of significant artifact. And then to think about electrical versus acoustic. But you can only work with what you get, right? You know, people are able to record these face lock responses in cochlear implant. Um, some group in Belgium, they're trying. Um, but you have to look at the response, it's time waveform, and then say, what are the time domain and frequency domain measures that we can use? So if those responses have uh, any attributes, both in the spectral and time domain, I'm sure you can apply these measures, okay? But as I said, Easier said than done. Uh, I want somebody else to take care of it. It's uh, beyond my pay scale. Uh, 
uh, sir, uh, we can ask the uh, audience also to ask questions if they are comfortable using the mic because they can switch on the mic and ask questions. Yeah, yeah, of course I'm comfortable. Yes. So, uh, sir, one more question uh, which came out was uh, when when we, I mean, what is the in instrumentation part of it? What is, uh, which which instrument uh, do, do you have experience with and, and how is the software? Is it user-friendly in terms of... Uh, manipulating or creating more uh, stimuli? Yeah, that's a good question actually, because uh, a concern which Sandeep also brought up is it's all well and good to have all these fancy responses. The question is how easily can you measure and analyze them in a clinical situation? Uh, as he indicated, uh, you know, I'm willing to share some of the software we use if anybody is interested, it's in MATLAB. Uh, but IHS is the system I use. In uh, I played a big role in developing the, with uh, Rafael, the developing means not the electronics or the software part of it, but giving input as to what the needs are for my research to develop the advanced research module. And even now, for example, we have developed something that will allow us to uh, provide visual cues and the sound synchronized to it. So we are looking at uh, effects of uh, visual cues on auditory representation in normal and hearing impaired. That's the dissertation that Aditi, another Aish graduate. Uh, so Aish does produce some good people. Um, yeah. So. I don't know about other systems. Most of them, they are, for clinicians, I think that's the IHS and they're very receptive. You know, if you want a certain application, Raphael will make sure that it's there. Uh, we are trying to do, you know, Sandeep talked about um, multi-frequency ABR. So we are developing something like that binaural, but we want an automated detection of responses. So. Uh, Raphael is working on it. Uh, once that comes through, then it will reduce uh, the time even more. And uh, that will be good for uh, clinical measurements. So uh, a lot of people, they uh, develop their own, but clinicians, even in the US, I don't think have the skill set and more importantly, the time to sit and uh, develop software uh, that'll work, troubleshoot it. You need users you know, because every user has a certain way they want. It should be user-friendly, intuitive, and things like that. But I think uh, IHS is pretty uh, uh, easy to use. If anybody is interested, uh, I can provide uh, steps how to do things there. I'm sure Sandeep, Sandeep can also help. So, uh, yeah, but I think... Uh, Above all, what I want is people who are in a position, clinical position, to move towards something new should consider these options rather than taking the easy route of continuing to do some of the things. Maybe these things might be better, in my view. Yeah. Dr. Sandeep, you have anything to say? Any clarifications, any questions? I was focusing on answering the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, go, I mean, uh, we could all see the answers here in the chat. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Actually, very interesting questions, no, in the chat also as to how... Uh, yes, I mean, that, that shows that, you know, people have very good understanding of the... Correct. Uh, correct. Whatever topic we discussed today, yeah. they have a good amount of information with them. So you said there were people asking questions on the microphone. Are they done or? <laughs> uh, we can just only call upon, sir. Anybody interested in asking questions, please, you can switch on the mics and ask also or put it in the chat. No, don't be scared. You know, all of us are here to learn. Even, I mean, I don't claim to know everything. So some questions I might not even be able to answer. So the question is, I mean, the thing is, you should learn, right? So the quest for knowledge shouldn't uh, uh, make you thinking, oh, I, this could be a stupid question or, you know, I don't know. Uh, no, ask away. 
Ravi sir, uh, uh, thank you a lot. I mean, this uh, talk actually cleared a lot of doubts that I had in my mind. Oh, very really helpful to me. Thank you. Oh, very good, very good. Yeah. Just uh, for the benefit of the listeners, sir, if I may ask, uh, just some clarification about uh, the EFRs um, that you mentioned about in hearing impaired people. Yeah. Uh, what what I believe I understood was that it is the temporal fine structure processing, which seems to be more of a issue than the temporal envelope processing. Am yeah. I am I understanding this correctly? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, what sort of I understood was that because of the broader auditory filters or poor frequency selectivity. um the fundamental frequency based stream segregation is usually the main problem you know for speech and noise issues in these population yeah so what i understood is that F- ffrs or efrs could be used to understand some of these issues uh, in fine structure processing and how certain hearing aid prescriptive strategies could overcome these fine structure deficits or yeah. do you feel like it's it's not really possible i don't know about not possible i my my thinking has always been does the hearing aid manufacturers who develop this process do they have a good understanding of the auditory system i'm not saying i think the european people now they are going towards this you know, they understand the system really well so there might be a bottleneck in what you're saying but what i'm saying is have we tried our best are we more concerned about amplification than signal processing you know uh so it might not be just making things louder is not going to solve the problem clearly and you also need the fine structure for pitch particularly musical pitch so you do have to do something you know uh, people have tried to move the frequencies to lower frequencies intuitively uh, you know the frequency lowering i don't understand how that works because you're changing the sort of the tonotopic map and uh, it has been shown uh, that when you change that you no longer can encode pitch properly i mean we did some studies where we did this frequency lowering you know josh alexander is my colleague and when you did this it affects both the periodicity of the waveform and also the harmonic relationship between the components and we saw a deterioration in both the envelope locking and uh, fine structure this was in normals you know one of my students did this project so we need to do uh, something about what are the different processing strategies that we can bring to the fore this is a this is a problem that needs time i'm sure there are smarter heads with more capabilities than i am who can um address this over time is not the problem is you know sometimes i feel like they're fixed on a certain process and stuck this 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 process and uh, forcing to achieve the results that they want it's trying to put a, a square peg in a circle that's not going to work right so that has to change you know i have all the respect for engineers but sometimes i wonder you know so that's that might be um now you talked about uh, stream segregation or concurrent sounds this would be a great we have been doing that and we have shown that uh, you know by the time you get to two semitones perceptually you should be able to Uh, separate the two streams and we have shown in the ffr also clear peaks but it's coming at more like um three semitones four semitones difference not at the two 
So uh, it's a, shall we say, the electrophysiologic measure is a bit more sluggish than the behavioral measure. But the behavioral measures is using everything. <laughs> you know, we are just looking at a population of neural elements. But that's a uh, that's an interesting thing to look at. You know, and we also have measures that can be developed looking at neural encoding of the same FO in co-located noise versus um, separated noise, which uh, individuals show benefit, almost like the binaural masking level difference sort of paradigm where, uh, you know, hearing in spatialized noise is using both cues, you know, you're using the head-related trans function, both interval time and intensity differences. So we were trying to look at some uh, FFRs for that, and we do show some gain in the separated condition versus the co-located condition. But someone has to do that. You know, I have this interest, but um, there's only so much I can do. Okay. But sure. what I'm saying is you capture that, you know, talked about segregation and you associate the EFR, it's tapping at the FO. Then you should be thinking about, yeah, what application can I use it for? Sure. Thank you so much for clarifying that, sir. Uh, no, no. A last question uh, we'll take from the audience. Uh, I believe it's regarding the uh, rectification mechanism that you mentioned at the um, peripheral level. Um, if you could explain how the amplitude modulated response gets affected by the rectification that is done physiologically. And uh, I mean, yeah. Sorry, um, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Are you finished with the question? Uh, I think it, the question is in two parts, sir. So what I'll do is I'll just finish the question and then maybe you can proceed with the clarification. So what I think the person is trying to ask uh, is that in the vestibular sort of responses, there is sort of not much rectification. So it's like a you know, bipolar sort of a response, yeah. whereas in the auditory sort of system physiologically there is the rectification yeah. so uh, how is it going to affect the vestibular versus the auditory response and also how the amplitude modulated response f naught and uh, harmonics and all that get affected by this physiological rectification no i showed you i mean uh, whatever you saw the response of efr it has undergone rectification there's no way around it for the auditory system because you know, right from the basal membrane, you know, if you look at the cross section of the cochlea, the displacement pattern, the there's a preferred axis of rotation and displacement of the stereocilia to open up windows to produce excitation of the hair cells, right? And it's unidirectional. And the auditory nerve is following that pretty much. Okay. So you can think of it uh, excitatory phase and inhibitory phase but nothing happens. We are using only those positive peaks during rectification, but the envelope information is still there because if you look at the time interval between those, it still captures the periodicity information. Sure. Thank I you so anything. much for... Yeah, I don't know anything about the vestibular system, so I'd be a wrong person to ask about. But if that individual says the vestibular system, there's no rectification, then you don't have to worry. It'll just show you the sinusoidal aspect of the stimulus. I would uh, like to ask that question again. Uh, so I understand that there is a half wave rectification uh, that happens for the auditory hair cells because they are uh, they get deflected only in one direction. Yeah. Uh, but the vestibular hair cells, uh, they can get deflected in both directions because their arrangement in, is such that mm. half side of the saccular hair cells get deflected in one direction and the other half get deflected in the other. Uh, so my question was, if similar amplitude modulated responses are recorded from the vestibular hair cells or from the vestibular nerve, will we see responses at additional frequencies compared to the 100 Hertz fundamental and its modulation? Since there is no rectification, you're not going to be having distortion product associated with rectification. So you might just see a peak at the nominal periodicity. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I think there happens 
the rectification process takes place at the vestibular hair cells as well. Okay, um, but you just said it. I was, yeah. What okay. I was expecting, because it happens in both directions, uh, would we see responses at additional frequencies compared to just seeing at 100 hertz, for example, 100 hertz and its multiples? Yeah, most likely you'll see it, but it's going to be hard for me to kind of um, conceptualize, you know, what are the phases of each of those motions? Can you break it down either in time or some measure of phase to say this bundle is active now, the other bundle, can you isolate them? Just like we separate the envelope from the fine structure. Can you do that in the vestibular system? Oh, my knowledge is very limited in that aspect. So what happens if you take that vestibular response uh, for each polarity and subtract them rather than alternating? What do you get? Uh -huh. oh, this is a very interesting, uh, what you have said. Recently, uh, Christopher Kleiner has published a couple of okay. papers um, using amplitude modulated responses. Yeah. And uh, the findings were very encouraging and uh, in expansion of that, there are some studies which are coming up. So my question was in that context, but I'll uh, take your advice and we'll try altering and changing some analysis parameters. Yeah, you can even, you, there are three things you can try. Uh, you can try a typical alternating and you can try unipolarity, you know, just leave it. So there should be both envelope and fine structure and then subtraction of the two and see how the behavior of the vestibular response either corresponds or deviates from the auditory behavior of the EFR and the FFR. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much, uh, uh, sir, for clarifying uh, so many questions and for a great talk and uh, it was very informative. I think it was, uh, I think your life's work uh, in a nutshell. So I understand it uh, took a little bit longer than uh, 45 minutes that we had planned. But I'm no, sorry about that. that. <laughs> I was trying to be slow, not go through fast. So no, no, sir. I think, I think. Uh, actually, it's that's to... actually, that slowness helps, sir. Helped okay, a lot good. in terms of grasping the concept. I mean, if it was faster, I, I'm sure none of us would have got most of it. So it was it was right pace. No, I think what uh, Isha and your role as there, I think this is a good idea to have these talks, but also in clinical practice, there has to be some of this information being trickling down to the practice level. You know, just an academic enterprise is not sufficient. It has to the it has to reach the clinical practice. That's what I'm saying. Um, I'm, I'm sure, sir, it will reach uh, because I think some of the clinical implications that you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, have, have far-reaching uh, you know, effects. And uh, I'm very sure that a uh, lot of clinicians would have taken uh, something, at least something uh, home. And I think one of the reasons why we had this talk uh, starting with fundamentals of auditory work potentials is because a lot of clinicians like me would have probably not had much touch with you know specific aspects of auditory work potentials for a long time like as you probably would have understood uh, you know like in clinical practice you know most of the audiologists uh, won't be using uh, uh, you know like specific evoke potentials like ffrs uh, on a day to day basis but obviously, we understand that there's far-fetching clinical implications and uses of it. And I think with your talk, I think uh, it made like you know, Dr. Sandeep you know, said, I think I have understood a lot of things that I had doubts on. And uh, especially the, the talks about, you know, like how you talked about frequency selectivity and uh, envelope structure, you know, fine and fine structure sort of effects on hearing impaired. And now you've actually talked about hearing aid process speech and, uh, you know, how things can, uh, you know, be, be used for uh, clinical benefit. I think it's a lot of, lot of uh, far-fetching implications. So 
you know it's it's about it's about who takes what home from from what yeah. uh, the talk is i'm very sure that people have taken a lot home thank you so much for sharing all this experience both dr sandeep and uh, dr krishnan uh, it was a wonderful talk and thank you listeners for joining in uh, i'm sure all of you uh, might be um, you know uh, feeling like it's uh, time to time to uh, switch off for uh, the weekend but uh, yeah thank you for joining in and we'll come back with another really exciting webinar for you sometime uh, next month till then uh, stay tuned thank you so much uh, everybody thank you all thank you i want to thank the organizer imran and uh, shri devi and also sandeep you know i think he did a good job and um, you should continue to do this um i think it's very useful for the consumers out there and again as i said uh, even for academic researchers i think uh, one advantage uh, you guys have here in india is there's no dearth for clinical population so translational research should be leading <laughs> and i mean in india compared to other places so i think that's my desire i want to see uh indian scientists uh, visible out there and uh, i want to feel proud about their achievements so i hope uh, you guys uh, work towards that thank you sir thank you dr sandeep thank you everybody thank you thank you the organizers and uh thank you sir thank you so much for welcome yeah is so that coffee date is still there sandeep it's pending sir it's pending i i will pending. show you get yeah, it remember i'm leaving august 12 so you need to make it before then that's it okay it will happen <laughs> good looking forward to that yeah bye yeah okay bye guys take it easy thank you sir bye yeah. sir bye Thank mm-hmm. you.